uh, I mentioned to her that um, we would, uh, I think she's not used to using Google Meet, so uh, pardon me, I'm, I'm going to have to walk her through through the process just now, so we're probably going to start in the next five minutes or something. Uh, but I see we have five people, welcome, thank you. Uh, Miss Madame uh, Dubeka, um, oh, oh, is it, I suppose Boomba, right? And uh, if your slides are ready, so if you move your mouse slightly at the bottom, um, you should be able to see a stream uh, that will have like a microphone, a video icon, and then to your far right, you'll find the present now button. Yeah, I've actually. Now, this yeah, is a. I've been able to figure it out. Oh, there we go. This is, uh, thank you so much. This is as to be expected, right? <laughs> um, okay, so you are ready to present your, uh, your screen? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, now I'll, I'll, I'll share a very um, unfortunate story. The other day I had a class and um, I didn't realize that my banking information was, um, was, somewhat available, some, it was visible, right? So I mm -hmm. normally record these sessions and we're recording it right now. And so I had to mask that portion, but so you want to be careful that you don't have anything that is sensitive that you don't want people to see, I suppose. But I'm guessing you're sharing the entire screen. So just a heads up, uh, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just okay. close everything other than what you want to show us, I suppose, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Sure. Yeah, especially people that are normally in management, maybe the disciplinary, is it hearings that you are attending to, or emails to say this person should be fired or something, right? And you never know, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah that's true. Yeah, so you probably want to make sure that. Um, so I see we have six people so far. So what I'm going to do is, uh, as, as, um, as our speaker is, is setting up or wanting to, in the process of uh, sharing this, Screen. <clears throat> and, uh, and then we can start, I suppose. Um, should we start now? Uh, I was hoping I could uh, introduce you first. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. or you, uh, some people prefer to introduce them, themselves, but no, you can go ahead. Like I, I suppose, <laughs> uh, I, I feel I feel somewhat uh, good about myself when I introduce people. Or something I don't know, but please, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. okay, great. Thanks. <clears throat> All right. Oh, and by the way, just uh, for those of you that are not aware, if you are not asking a question, maybe you mute your microphone, like uh, Elias, I see here, and we give, um, there's usually a bit of echo that comes out. Um, so you just want to make sure that your microphone is muted if, if, you're, if, if you're not saying anything. Elias, your microphone should be muted. I'm just, yeah. Can you mute your microphone, Elias Jerry? Right. Okay. So um, our speaker today is uh, is uh, Boomba M. Dubeka. Right now, I've never asked her what the M is for, but uh, what it stands for, the M. Dubeka. And she's she's currently the librarian at uh, Zikas University. Uh, she's been serving in this capacity since uh, June of 2018. So she's been around for quite some time. Um, but before that, she she worked um, with the Minister of Education as the librarian for Charles Luanga College of Education. Um, and she served in that, that capacity for five years. Um, she, she also worked as a monitoring and evaluation officer for New Partnership Initiative Project, which was funded by um, USAID. Um, and she's also currently uh, in her final stage of Master of Library and Information Science program at UNSA. So she's, she's also a master's student at, at the University of Zambia. Uh, today's talk is titled, or her talk is titled, Implementation of Institutional Repository at Zika's University. So if you are, if you are ready, uh, Bumba, maybe you can, you can proceed, I suppose. Okay. Yeah, so... I, I, don't, I don't know if you've shared your screen yet. I think you haven't shared your screen yet. 
Are you able to you see able it? To see it? Uh, not yet. So I suppose maybe when you when you click the present now, did you did you share? Did you click the part that says your entire screen? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then. Oh. And Are then. No, not yet. So when you click on entire screen, there's a pop-up window that should come up. And then once you click in there, you should see uh, the share button turn blue. And then you click the share button. I don't know if you did mm. that. I have, but the share button is not turning blue. OK, so it will turn blue if you click in the, the pop-up pop window that comes up. Mm -hmm. you, you click inside it, the image itself. Just tap on the image, and then it should turn blue. OK, yeah, it has. Yeah, and then you can share the screen, I suppose. Okay. And here's to hoping there is no disciplinary email or something. Say, you have been fired. <laughs> okay. All right, and I think we can, I can see the screen. I don't know about the other colleagues. Uh, and please, as before we start, maybe you can tell us your preference on whether you'd want people to ask to ask questions to interrupt you, or if you'd prefer for for them to ask questions towards the end. Um, uh, I normally prefer towards the end myself, but it's up to you. Thank you. Um, I don't mind either. So if you feel like asking while we are while we are interacting, I'm still okay with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as Lighton said, I basically would just like to share our experiences at Zikas as regards the uh, implementation of of our institutional repository. So I thought before we start, we could uh, actually, I thought we could have an understanding of, of what an academic library is so that we, we, we appreciate where the idea of, of a repository is coming from. So basically, an academic library is one which is attached to a higher learning of institution and the whole purpose is to support the curriculum and the research of the university faculty and students at large. So we all know that we are in a changing world and the dynamics in education and educational provision have changed. And as information specialists or as librarians, we also need to step up and have library services that provide um, the needs or meet the various needs of his clientele minus the restriction of time and space. And one way in which this can be achieved is to have a digital library. And uh, one may ask what a digital library is. We know that it's a database of digital objects that can include a lot of things like text, still images, audio, video, digital documents, or other digital formats. And the typical example of a digital library, there are a lot of examples, but obviously I chose the institutional repository as one of the examples of a digital library. We might want a definition, and so I thought we could just have a brief definition of an, an institutional repository. And in our case, it's an archive for collecting, preserving, and disseminating digital objects of intellectual output of an institution. And in this case, a research institution or, um, or a university. And why should we have an uh, institutional repository? So in our case at Zikas, we wanted to have an institutional repository so that we can be able to manage preserve and maintain the digital assets, intellectual output and histories of uh, on the history of our institution. And this can apply across the board for academic institutions or for any other library that might want to have an institutional repository. Another reason obviously would be to create global visibility for an institution's scholarly research. We want as much as possible to share the institution's scholarly research findings with the world. And one way we thought this can happen is to have an institutional repository. So I'm going to talk about the implementation process of the institutional repository at Zikas. 
we basically began working towards establishment of uh, an institutional repository in March 2019. Um, though it's not indicated here, I must mention that uh, we had a, a brief training or yeah, a brief workshop as regards institutional repositories where we were taught and how to go about the same. And after that training, we began our discussions with the IT department because currently our library does not have uh, a specified or a dedicated IT personnel. So we work hand in hand with our IT department to come up with the idea of the institutional repository. So after our discussions, we went on to set up the platform and uh, during setup, we did trial uploads here and there. And after a number of uploads, that is uploads of student dissertations and thesis, we launched the repository to the internal community of Zikas, and that is the faculty and other members of staff. And since we launched it, we made it, and after the launch, we made it live. and. Um, I must apologize that right now it's going through maintenance, but I'm going to share a, a screen as how as regards how a repository looks like when you just log in. And since then we have been continuously trying to upload our student thesis as well as our faculty's uh, journal research articles and the like. So during the process of our implementation, there are a lot of lessons that we learned, and uh, I must say this is still work in progress for us. But as we have been going on, there's been a lot of lessons that we've learned, and uh, we would like to share those lessons. And if there's anyone who's uh, thinking of beginning a, re a repository, these lessons would be a good starting point to to uh, to to implement. An, an institutional repository. So I think the starting point would be having a CPD as regards sensitizing the members of on what an, an institutional repository is and what is required for its smooth operation. Because um, in our case, I noticed that not every one of us was really conversant with uh, with the processes, and not everyone was really conversant with uh, what needs to be done. So having a CPD or maybe frequent sessions with the people involved as what is required ab about an institutional repository. So this CPD could involve the library staff. It could also involve the lecturers or the faculty themselves because they also need to understand what needs to be done on their part as they send in documents to the repository. So another thing that we learned is that there's needs to have an ingestion policy as well as guidelines. So this was going to serve as a standard operating procedure which describes the process which describes the procedure and guidelines for ingestion of publications. So publications could be conference papers, could be uh, student ETDs, it could be journal articles. So any form of publication that you might wish to ingest or upload in the repository, we felt that there was need to have an ingestion policy and guidelines, and that is what we are currently working towards, uh, we are currently working towards having this policy. And the thinking behind is, if today we leave Zika's, the people that will come behind after us will find this document in black and white, and they might not have to struggle, or they might not have to start from one to ingest or go about running the repository. So basically, another objective for the policy is to ensure that the submitted publications are eligible for ingestion. And the other um, 
objective is to make sure that uh, the profile of Zika's university research output is raised and made visible and accessible. What do I mean by making sure that uh, publications are eligible for ingestion into the repository? There are factors that you need to consider as whether this is an original work of someone, whether you are not violating any policy agreements or, uh, or embargoes. So there's need to make sure that whatever you are going to put out there for everyone to see is eligible and does not put the institution in dispute. Another lesson we learned while implementing our repository, we, say, we thought for journal articles authored by Zika staff but not published by the Zika University, copyright guidelines for the publisher shall apply. So our experience was or has been, we have a lot of articles that are, have been authored by our faculty but these articles are actually not published by Zika's University. They are published by other journals out there. And so our beginning point was we were just uploading those without actually understanding or reading through the copyright guidelines for the original publishers who are the journal who are the journals of uh, the articles where they the, the faculty would publish in. So after we realized that we, ca we came up with a policy and that this is also appearing in our policy to say the copyright guidelines for the publisher shall apply. So if the uh, publisher allows or permits that we share as open access, we would share via our repository. If those publishers do not um, allow, we obviously would not share. And that was the experience. We had to pull out some of the journals we had put because of those copyright restrictions. We also had uh, instances where the journals, where the articles are appearing, would allow to share via our repository on condition that we acknowledge the original source of that um, publication. And so what we have done is just put a, a link of that journal together with the hand, we put a URL for that journal as a additional metadata or, or handle. And that enables, or rather that protects the institution as not violating the copyright. We also learned that there's need to be clear on which collections to deposit what journal or what publication or which publication. Um, institutional structures, institutional repository structures vary according to institutional needs. So it is very important to clearly state which collection and co community should house the various university publication. So a classic example, I think the UNSA repository, being a student at UNSA, I've had to interact with the UNSA repository. The structures mostly is in schools and schools, I think, are then later subdivided into departments. For Zika's, we are, um, we are, we, are, we are literally just growing and we have about three, or three schools currently running. So what we have on our repository, we have structured it according to schools. That is the School of Business. We have the School of uh, Social Sciences and the School of uh, Information Communication Technology. So in those schools, we also have communities, which is uh, journal articles, and uh, we also have a community for thesis and dissertations. So for journal article community, this is where we put articles by faculty of that particular school. For the thesis and dissertations, this is where we upload uh, thesis and dissertations by our students in the particular schools. 
We also noted that it is important to be clear as regards metadata and which metadata scheme to use. So this space, which is a platform on which uh, our institutional repository is sitting, is using the Dublin core as a default. And so we decided to actually just adopt that. And for clarity's sake, this appears also in our ingestion policy. And like I said, this is just to guide people and act as a, a roadmap to show whoever would come after us or a new person who might come to show or to guide them on how to go about it. And really the main reason for this is to ensure uniformity in how the, the, the information is, um, is broadcast out there. So we have the contributing author, if it's for, uh, this applies to, to both the thesis and dissertation as well as the journal articles. We have all these other things that appear on the screen. And we thought it is very important to clearly state and it acts as a guideline. So if I'm new and I'm ingesting content with such a guideline, I can be able to quickly note where or what I've left out. So like I said, the table shows the Dublin Core Metadata Scheme and it's used as the default encoding scheme during the ingestion of digital repositories in our repository. We also learned that uh, there's need to use controlled vocabularies. And so we know that uh, controlled vocabulary is a selected list of words or phrases basically used to tag units of information. And the whole reason is to increase retrieval. So another one would say controlled vocabulary is a standardized group of words and it provides terminology to catalog and uh, retrieve information. So basically, if we do have controlled uh, vocabularies, it makes life easy as um, regards when someone is searching out there, it, it increases the, the, the chances or it increases retrieval at the end of the day. One other lesson we learned is that um, there was no consistency in, in, in ingesting names of authors. I'll give a classic example where you have, uh, for instance, a doctor who has authored um, an article. That same doctor authors a different article and you have two people ingesting those articles. So our experience was um, you'd find that in one, they're appearing as doctor. In another, they're just appearing as a mister or missus or miss. So when it comes to searching and uh, in terms of uniformity and probably just uh, having a clean outlook, it was a bit difficult to even keep track of who does what. This is very easy for us who are probably employees of Zikas. You can know that probably Dr. Kayonfo is a, is a member of Zikas. But if someone is searching out there and they want to search for a particular author, Mr. Kayombo and Dr. Kayombo would be totally two different people. So we thought we should put it as policy to have this, to have some consistency in as regards the version of names for authors. And basically it's easy identification and tracking of authors. And in institutions of learning, obviously sometimes there's grading that happens for faculty based on the number of research or the amount of research you have done. And so if this is done by an external person, it might be a bit difficult to, to know who a Mr. Kayombo is or a Dr. Kayombo is. So we decided, or rather we thought it would be good to put it as policy 
to stick to the same version of names for this reason. Another lesson we learned in our in our work or in our implementation, you would find that because of having different people ingesting content at different times, there wasn't uniformity in writing. Sometimes you would find a time. Sorry, excuse me. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you don't mind being interrupted. No, um, no, no. When you were talking about uh, Mr. Kayombo and uh, Dr. Kayombo, mm -hmm. I've, I've just said you decided as policy to do something, but I'm not clear on um, what you have done about that. Okay. So what okay, we have. So what we have. Thank you. Okay. So, so what we are, have actually done is. Um, we have decided that for people with PhD, we all we include the doctor title at the uh, when ingesting. For everyone else, like we do just for authors, we do not include the Mr. Mrs. Miss title. Um, um, um okay, so 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 what what happens with the documents they did before Doctor, are they still put in the same category? Or... Yeah, I think. Uh, what happens to someone who, after today, they become a doctor? Are you then going to move all their 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 documents to that, or what are you going to do? I think we'll do that because at the end of the day, the of we the just day, want this for easy identification, identification among ourselves. Among ourselves. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, up, up, up there. there, you know. Uh, okay, I'm not saying you should change, but um, I was thinking that for the sake of avoiding the confusion altogether, isn't it just enough to to, to do it the way we do with offers? It's just the surname and the first name or initials without bothering with the title. Mm, we'll put that in consideration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, where am I speak? Who is this? Stundu. Stundu oh. from Camila. <laughs> oh, noted. So we'll put that on. Okay, thank you. Noted. Noted. <laughs> um, so we were talking about writing style, and uh, we said our experience was you find that some people would, would ingest content in cups as in upper casing, others would put content the normal way we write. And uh, we felt this was really also distorting or rather this didn't look very neat on our end. And so we thought we put it also as policy or, or as guideline that no more writing shall apply when ingesting content. Only in cases where it is important to use upper casing shall it be used. So our Zika students have a, a writing style which is provided for, for ETDs. So we encourage that even as we are ingesting content in our repository, those should be followed. And uh, as a, an officer or as a librarian or a library or personnel who's ingesting content, they must make sure that the provided guidelines are followed based on the various schools because the other two schools have the same one. The School of Law has a different format. So to maintain uniformity, we thought this should also come out in our in our guidelines. One of the lessons learned also is uh, most of the articles or the the content that we have on our repository was not indexed on Google Scholar, so it is work in progress on our end. Would like to have most of our faculty's research output indexed on Google Scholar for increased visibility. 
and also just a note that the policy should exist to ensure conformity to set out guidelines and ensure uniformity. Um, this is where I end, thank you. Unless there are questions, Dr. Perry. Oh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Dubeka. Right? That was really nice. Now, uh, I, I, I happen to have a bit of uh, insight in terms of yeah. what what our colleagues from Zikas have been doing. In fact, not too long ago, they invited us, myself and uh, a colleague of mine, Abel and uh, Zachary. Mm -hmm. uh, they invited us to a very nice event. They fed us actually, which was quite nice. So um, I, uh, I, I don't have any specific questions myself. I'll leave it up to the people in the audience to, to share their thoughts or to ask questions. But I just wanted to point out that some of the things that um, um, that Bumba was talking about um, are probably going to come up again on Wednesday when we have um, the current acting institutional repository manager for the University of Zambia Library, Zachary. Um, and I, I, I do believe he's going to touch a little bit on policy, but his focus is going to be on how you get to market your IR, right? So uh, issues that uh, Bumba was talking about with regards to indexing content uh, so that when people search for Scoring research output on platforms such as Google Scholar, your scoring publications appear there, right? Uh, and then also uh, on Thursday, there's another talk by Abel, which is more aligned towards open access publishing, but you probably want to attend because these things are linked. But so I'll uh, invite questions if people have any specific questions for uh, Boomba. I know I see people in the house that perhaps might be interested in implementing or launching IR. So I guess now would be the time to ask questions so that you learn a thing or two. Feel free to ask if you have a question. It's uh, open season. Hello. Hello. Hello, Cecilia. Uh, uh, yes, uh, how are you? I just want to comment on the... Okay. <laughs> okay, Harriet, I think you can go first. All right. Yes, I, it's, my question is uh, regarding the inconsistency, the consistency of uh, describing data that you, when you were, when you were talking about uh, the titles, mm -hmm. where if somebody has a PhD, we include doc, mm -hmm. and then the other one, you don't, you just write, uh, like, I don't know, just the name itself. Mm -hmm. So I, I know there was uh, a concern that uh, it will bring inconsistency mm -hmm. because others will be just moved as, 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 as they are. And then when a person has a title like PhD, you include dog. But I, I also want to, to talk about the RDA. You know, when we are describing data, we are RDA demands that the person's credentials, for example, titles and whatever, it has to be included. Now, I don't know if at all we, you remove uh, the title of that person. Are you, are you going against what we are supposed to do? Because in as much as we are doing, we are working on the digital information resource. We also have, have to consider that there is uh, this uh, you know, system that we follow, like RDA. I don't know if it is related to, to like uh, ED, EDT. I don't know if uh, I got you correctly, but what we have adopted is the Dublin Core Scheme, Metadata Scheme. So yes. um, I would stand to be corrected whether that has to be in sync with RDA. Like I said, we are learning, and uh, I was basically sharing our, uh, our experiences. So as regards RIDA, that's something we'd have to go back to and uh, see. All right, all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, right. all right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, how are you, Wumba, once again? Hi, Cecilia. Yes, hi. I have uh, two questions. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the first one... Uh, is I just want to find out on which server as uh, do you have like different servers for the Koha and the repository or you just use a single one? 
I want to presume they sit on different tables. I'm not so IT, I'm not, uh, I can't say I have much information as regards the servers they sit on. That would have to be, I'd have to I, get consultation from my, our IT personnel. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, then um, the other one is you did talk about CPD, <clears throat> like as one of the problems that you encountered, having not trained the people like Prio, the implementation, did you let her do it? And if you did, who were your target uh, people? Was it the academicians? Was it the students? Did you include other staffs? And uh, how was your experience? Was it successful? Because I did notice that at the time we had um, installed, at the time we started using our e-resources, like on last year, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't do much literacy training, and as a result, uh, they were not used as according to our expectations. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think it is important that before anything is implemented, people are trained, like yeah. you just uh, mentioned. So I just want to find out how you did it, if at all you did, and how you managed to bring them to the library for the training. Okay, so... Mm -hmm. We, a few of us attended the, the training or the workshop. I think it was organized by Unilas. I can see Mr. Chilonga, so he would probably um, uh, shed more light. But there was a CPD, there was a workshop organized by Unilas for, should have been African thesis and dissertation, something like that. So after we attended that training, a few of us from Zika's, we later on um, shared what we learned with our colleagues. And after that, we initiated talks with IT and started working towards uh, probably having a platform. We later on spoke to, we have a director for research and consultancy. So in collaboration with that directorate or in, in collaboration with the director, we now communicated to the research head and uh, the heads of department to send to forward the the journal articles that are probably sent to their department and also there was uh, some that were sitting on our website as just uh, research for zikas so after we did the uh, some uploads of uh, a number of them together with the student publications. We called for a meeting with, um, with the faculty through the office of the vice chancellor. So we called for faculty where we just convened in one, one of the lecture theaters and we launched the repository to them. And basically we showed them what it is all about we shared to them the benefits of having a repository and the benefits of having a central place where the research output of the university or an institution can be located. So I can say from the part of the lecturers and then from the students, we have a student management system which allows them to log in and be able, and once they are logged on to that system, they are able to see the other systems that are there and are able to see or view this space. And so I can say that uh, from the lecturer's point of view, from the teaching staff end, we've had uh, quite a good response from, from them. We might need to do more as regards sensitizing the students once they come back, or we might even say, because we have their contacts, so we'll do more as regards sensitizing the student. Thank you. All right, any, any more questions? Okay. Uh, right, if there are no questions then, uh, 
so I just shared a, a link to the, uh, I know she had mentioned that um, that the server was done, but I checked and I noticed, I think it's back online. So I shared a link in case people are interested in having a few of how the Zika's repository looks like. Um, uh, so there's a link in the, in the chat there. Uh, uh, so if there are no questions, I just wanted to thank our speaker today. Uh, we know she's a very busy person, right? These are busy times here. Oh, sorry, there's a question here uh, from Adrian saying, I don't know if he doesn't want to use the microphone, but I'll speak to him as well. Yeah. Um, evening, Boomba, could you clarify on the following formats from different schools as you are uploading? On following formats, I don't know what he means here, but uh, I, I see you can see the comment, the, the text, Boomba. I don't know if you understand the question, but I'm... I don't think I do. Maybe he's still typing or something. Okay. If you can... Hello. Hello. I think what he says to say you clarify on following, how do you go about the format see, from the different schools as you are uploading? There's a guideline provided to students to follow as they are writing or as they, are, as they write their dissertation. So there's an institutional guideline that is provided to them. So basically that's what I meant. I don't know if that answers uh, your question. We will assume it, it does because uh, there's no follow-up uh, message in the chat here. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. surprised that uh, uh, colleagues that are enrolled into 5310 are not asking questions, especially- Oh, actually, the, Adrian the, says yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I'm actually surprised that we, are, we don't have a lot of questions coming in from our colleagues that are enrolled in 5310 because uh, we, we've actually just wrapped up, or at least we're almost wrapping up uh, our discussion of this particular topic. Uh, okay. So we were expecting a lot of questions. But anyway, I suppose maybe most of what uh, uh, Bumba talked about was clear. Uh, hey, again. Thank you so much for finding time to do this, Bumba, especially that it's pro bono work, as the lawyers call it, right? Uh, <laughs> we are very grateful. We know you're a very busy person. Uh, but I think this is one of the ways we can move forward. Uh, the yeah. way we see this, I mean, we, we invite people that are actually doing this sort of work so that we can, we can try and see how we can encourage other institutions. Uh, mm -hmm. There are about 60 institutions of higher learning to, you know, if they, they haven't yet set up repositories, uh, so yeah. that they can set up the repository, or at the very least, the public higher education institutions, the, the seven that, that we have. Uh, so thank you so much. We are very grateful. Uh, we, we hope you can join us on, on Wednesday. We, we think that your insight uh, will be very helpful once, um, once Zachary gives a talk um, that's, that's going to be from the perspective of the UNSA institutional repository. So it would be nice if we could have it back and forth, if you have time. The talk sure. is like 18 hours. Yes. Would, 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 would definitely join. And uh, I must also say that uh, we are grateful for the guidance we've been getting from UNSA. We've uh, learned quite a lot as regards how to go about our institutional repository. So on behalf of the Zika's library, I would like to say thank you and uh, we keep learning from you people. So thank you too for having us. Yeah, and I think we, we learn from each other. You notice that uh, I'm sure, I wish Zachary was around. I'm sure there are things that you're definitely doing better that Unza could learn from, right? So yeah. it's more about learning from each other. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank to the you. people, to the 15, is it 14, oh my goodness me, 13 people that uh, were around mm -hmm. to listen to Boomba's talk. Thank you so much for attending. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope to see you on Wednesday. Thank you. I'll ask the 5310 students to stick around because I think we're meant to have an interaction or something. Thank you so oh. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Wumba. Thank you very much, Madam Mutelo. All right, so we were, we were supposed to have an interaction where we have uh, a simple walkthrough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, I suppose, um, and then maybe we can, we can continue from where we left off. Um, today's talk, right? Today's talk was supposed to be just a walkthrough of uh, just this space to try and consolidate the 
things that we we have been talking about I mean, looking at the various um, theoretical concepts in the metadata um, interoperability protocols and um, fundamentals with regards to the digital library system when viewed using those three layers, right? That three layered structure where you have the user interface, the service layer and the storage layer. Um, but there was someone who had uh, insisted that we we attempt to do an installation. Now, I don't know if, if that's going to work here, but uh, maybe we can try and do that. We will, uh, I don't know how people feel about this. We can either, attempt to do the installation once we do the walk the walkthrough or we can start with the installation and then do the simple walkthrough using the demo uh, oh using the demo the demo instance I don't know what people's preference or is here what they prefer and I'm not sure if everybody is, is keen to go through the process of uh, installing this space. So if, if, if it's just one person, then maybe we can exit or maybe we don't have to do the whole installation. Uh, for me, I'm interested in also learning how the installation is done because I think that is a tricky part. Mm, okay. Yes. Okay, I mean, seeing as we're supposed to go from 18 to 20, we can do the installation, I guess, that's not a problem. We can start with the installation then. Um, and I was thinking, I've, I've not installed this piece in a while, but same process. And I was thinking maybe we can install the current stable release, right? So the the thing with this piece, like I said, is um, like we mentioned, is it's, it's one of many uh, so-called uh, free, freely available and open source software tools, right? So uh, what that means is that you can literally just go out there and download this space and then you install it. But there's a very nice wiki page. Uh, I'm not sure if you can still see my screen here, but I've just gone to the wiki page. Um, and part of what that wiki page has is it has a whole, a whole range of things. It's, this is a comprehensive documentation. Um, so there's a, there's a part of the documentation that is specific to outlining how you go about using this space on a day-to-day -day basis, managing this space, um, making use of specific aspects of this space, because it turns out that this space is, is made up of so many different components, right? There are certain features that are optional. So when you're doing the installation process, you undergo a process where you install what I refer to as components. These are standalone applications. So there's a search application, which is responsible for facilitating searching and browsing, so indexing of content. Right? Um, and incidentally, that component is nothing more than Apache Solar. Right? We, we get to discuss Apache Solar once we look at module number seven, which is information retrieval. So your average DSpace instance is incorporated or is integrated with an Apache Solar application. It's the one that makes it possible for you to search for content and view these results, these are, they are in, indices in the background, right? But not only that, you get to selectively install subcomponents like the, the SWORD application, which allows remote um, remote deposit of content. Just to maybe to showcase, I will showcase some of the, before I do the installation, I'll showcase, uh, I'll log into our list server, which has uh, an instance of uh, this space installed, so that I showcase the applications. Get to install. Uh, okay, there we go. So I will. Web apps. So th these are the applications, right? So the JSP UI and the XML UI are nothing more than the 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 application and the subcomponent that helps in the rendering of content on the public and uh, admin user interface. So this thing that you see here, this interface can be selectively rendered using the JSP UI or the XML UI. If you noticed what I had shared in the chat when uh, Boomba was uh, doing her talk, I had sh shared uh, the Zcash link that has the JSP UI interface, right? So Zcash is currently using uh, the JSP UI interface. But assuming that they deployed the XML UI interface, you notice that if you change this to XML, 
UI, you should be able to see the equivalent interface, but presented in a sort of like different manner, right? Uh, if this is not going to be possible, we can do this using the display instance for CBU. So if you see, you notice that once I click the CBU interface, the CBU display interface, what what I um, what uh, what I'm accessing actually when I when I look up this space is this JSP UI interface. But what what I can do is I can because I know that uh, I expect them to have deployed the XML UI interface as well. I can just change um, the the resource portion of the URL so that I see the equivalent and there we go. So this is Zika's XML user interface, JSP user, sorry, XML user interface. And then you also have JSP user interface, JSP UI. So JSP UI, XML UI. Now clearly, I guess the, the IT people from Zcash have not realize that they, they maybe have deployed this particular application, right? And you can see this because it doesn't have the nice logos. It's not yet branded. If you look at the, the card setting, it's not branded, right? But still you get access to the content. So besides the JS, UI and the XML user interface I mentioned you have uh, one vision two. Apache Solar which facilitates search, the REST application which makes it possible for you to be able to interact with an application, machine to machine interaction. Uh, it's similar to OIPMH protocol, but it's, it's somewhat different because you can do much more with the REST uh, user interface. And I think I may have, uh, I do believe I did, I may have, uh, uh, <clears throat> I may have used the demo interface to showcase to you exactly what sort of interface you're presented with when you interact with the REST API. So with the REST API, you, you can programmatically interact with the user, inter with, the, with the repository. And there's real power in that because you can create standalone applications that will, will be making use of information that is stored in the DSpace repository. And there's nothing new with this idea really. We see it with uh, Facebook's Graph API or Twitter's uh, streaming API, right? Which is why these days you have different applications that will uh, automatically pull information from Twitter and Facebook, right? I don't know if you've seen uh, sites like Zambian Watchdog where, um, Zambian Watchdog, where some of the comments that are rendered, uh, actually it's supposed to be Facebook comments. That is possible because of an API, right? So a typical graph, oh, not a thing. I wanted the website itself because of the API, right? So this is essentially what the REST application for this space does. Right? so if I click on, uh, oh, I didn't know someone dies, everybody dies, but uh, if I come here and I go to the comments section, I don't know if you can see this, this part that says Facebook comments. We are able to integrate this with um, this feature with a website like Zambian Watchdog because of an API. So this is precisely why this space uh, is deployed. It's not by default, you choose what you want to deploy with the REST application. Then there's an IDF application, there's also an OAI application which facilitates OAI PMH, uh, which turns your repository into an OAI PMH data provider, OAI PMH harvester, right, application. So using your this space application like this, you can either harvest data from other repositories using this application, or you can configure this uh, repository, this dispose repository in such a way that other applications can extract information from it via the OIPMH protocol. All right. So the documentation also has, this is a wiki page. I'll share this in the link. Documentation also has the part where uh, there's a description of how you go about installing uh, installing this space. So this is not yet a stable release. I was hoping we could install this, but the current stable release is 6.3. I don't know if you can see this, it's in green, right? But this space seven is still available, uh, but it's currently beta, right? So they're still testing. So we'll try and see if we can just install 
to three. Um, and what I'm going to do is I hope my, my virtual machine is going to work. I don't want to use my my machine. I want us to use a clean um, a clean setup. So in the documentation itself, if you look at this documentation page, there's uh, an introduction, obviously, which introduces DSpace, but there's also a second part here which outlines how you go about installing DSpace. This would be your starting point if you're installing DSpace. Um, from here, you get to choose the part of the documentation which is specific to the operating system where you're going to install DSpace. You can install DSpace on a Windows platform or on the Unix platform. I'm going to showcase an example where you install on um, the Unix platform. Okay. Um, so the, the starting point, right, is um, obviously you would have to first of all make sure that the hardware where you're going to be installing DSpace has the resources, the minimum resources required for the installation. Right, um, there are these hardware recommendations here. So if you go under hardware recommendations and you click this link, for instance, it takes you to, it takes you to um, a part which has interesting things like, these are important, uh, important requirements to look at, like you must ensure that you have at least two to three GB of RAM. Right? And typically, you would install this space on a server. I know someone asked the question to say, do you have this space installed on the same server as Koha? It's possible. It's possible in the event that the server has sufficient memory requirements, right? <clears throat> so two to three GB of RAM, and then storage space of at least 20 GB according to this. Uh, but what they're saying here is uh, just enough space for files that you want to install on this space. So the, the, the storage requirements would would be aligned with how you see yourself scaling as an organization. So let's say assuming uh, Unilas was wanting to install DSpace for the first time. One, one, one thing to think about is how you see yourself growing as an organization, let's say in the next five years or something. And then using those, those sort of details, we'd be able to approximate whether 20 GB would be enough. But, but these days, storage space has become so cheap that uh, I mean, you can, you can even just uh, uh, purchase one terabyte or maybe slightly more actually, uh, terabytes of data anyway at, at a relatively uh, low cost, right? I mean, as an example, if you look at my, my computer, for instance, it's my personal computer, which wasn't really that expensive, it has half a terabyte of space, right? <clears throat> uh, so in terms of, um, in terms of uh, minimum requirements, these are the ones, but you notice that again on this page, they'll tell you to say, when you're deploying this DSpace in a production environment, you should at least think of RAM with a minimum of 4 GB. And the reason you want to do this is the same RAM is the RAM that is going to be consumed when other people from the outside are accessing content on your DSpace repository, right? So this RAM is not just to run the application, but to handle the load that is going to be imposed on the server as more and more people are accessing the application. So think of it from the perspective of uh, the UNSA repository. On a given day, you probably have hundreds of people logging on at the same time. So you want to make sure you have sufficient resources, right? Um, and then I'm not sure if people are still there. Is this making sense? I'll pause for a little while. Hello, is this making sense or not? Uh, I'm pausing. Uh, we are trying I'm, to follow I'm you, sorry. Doc. Okay. Hello. So the reason I ask is, yes, thank you for that. The reason I constantly ask is because there are times when I lose connection and so I need to know that I'm not talking to myself. Uh, so uh, if you just respond uh, or just type in the chat that you're following, that would be good so that in case I lose connection, I can easily reconnect or something. Okay. So the prerequisite, right? Now, usually, if, if, you're, if you're in the library, if you're, you don't have a large library which has a systems librarian, I know the Investor of Zambia has hired system librarians. These are people with IT skills. So they're not dependent on our so-called IT department. It's a directorate, CICT. 
So within the library, there's expertise. There are people that have IT skills. So these are the people that would, would install this space. But in the event that you don't have expertise, you direct the people in IT to say, this is where you find information about this space. And then they'll be able to see details to do with the prerequisite uh, required for the hardware and the software. Right. So there's a hardware prerequisite information, um, but there's also prerequisites to do with the software, right? So this is under two. Now, the idea behind the prerequisite software uh, associated with the prerequisites associated with the software is twofold. The software, well, obviously you need to install this space on an operating system, right? And currently, I think the supported OSs is uh, Unix-like operating systems and Windows operating systems, right? These are most widely used types of operating systems. So typically, if you have server infrastructure in your workplace, they'll typically be Unix-like. So it would be Linux, for instance, Ubuntu, Red Hat, um, or any Debian variant, right? Perhaps with BSD or something. Um, so you can currently install DSpace either on a Unix-like operating system or a Microsoft Windows operating system. Like I said, I will, I will do this, will attempt to do this installation in a Unix-like operating system. Besides the operating system, and I'll showcase, maybe if I can just showcase my operating system, I'll log into VirtualBox. I have an operating system, which is Ubuntu. I'll open this, and I hope I have sufficient storage there, and I'll have to close this because my memory runs out. This card. So I, I have uh, a Unix operating system, a sandbox that I'm going to use to install this, right? This is a virtual machine that I'm running. It's clean. There's nothing that the operating system installed on this uh, virtual box that, I've, that I'm going to log into here. ICT 11.10. So I, we will install this space in this virtual machine or this virtual environment. Uh, just log in. Before we continue, I just want to showcase to you that this virtual machine is actually Linux. Um, and you'll notice that if I, in this virtual machine, if I, if I check the type of operating system that I'm working with, you will immediately realize that it's actually a Unix-like operating system. So if I run uh, Union A here, right, it's Linux. And the fact if it just is the least. Um, I'm, I'm, we're going to install it on Ubuntu. Oh, I didn't know if it was 20. I hope it will, it will install it within Ubuntu, 20.0.4. In terms of the requirements, you'll notice that I have uh, Oh, it looks like I don't have, I, this thing has a uh, 10 GB of space. I wonder if this will, might not work. I hope there's a way of increasing this space, but we'll see. But in terms of uh, RAM, you'll notice that uh, I have three, 3 GB of RAM here. So already this virtual machine, this computer, so you can see what this environment I'm working in as being a virtual machine that I'm going to use to install this space in. It has the prerequisite requirements needed, right? Uh, so it's a Unix-like operating system. It, it has at least production, it's going to be a test. It has at least between two to three GB of RAM, right? And looking at the space here, maybe I should just, instead of using this machine, I will just use my own machine and anyway, it's fine. I'll power this down because we don't want to, I, I can still use my machine, it's fine. I'll close that virtual machine. We'll use my machine. My machine also runs, uh, notice here, let's be, it runs uh, 18.0.4. It has, uh, because this is a host machine, it has a uh, 12 GB of RAM. So 12 GB of RAM is more than sufficient. Um, space is sufficient. I currently have um, 27 GB of free space. Uh, which should be more than enough, right? So, so what I'm showcasing is what you would have to go through to make sure that the prerequisite software is available. Before you install this space, you must ensure that you pass these prerequisites that I'm going through. So we went to the OS. The next stage is we go to these uh, software components that you need. This space is a CMS. 
content management system. It's implemented in Java. Because it's implemented in Java, you need the Java JSDK for it to work. This is one of the components you need. The building of this space is done on the fly via the internet. So you need Apache Maven for the building process. You also need Apache Ant when you're building this space itself. You see how the building is done. More importantly, the metadata is stored in a relational database management system. So we need to install that piece of software. Remember, an RDBMS is nothing more than a piece of software. I mentioned that uh, this space is implemented using Java, right? So it's deployed as a servlet container. So you need a servlet engine, a web application server. Uh, they recommend Apache Tomcat. So we need to install Apache Tomcat, but you can also install JET if you want to, um, or any other, I, I guess, um, web application server that is able to execute um, Java servlets, right? Or Java code, essentially. You also need Git. Uh, it's a vision control piece of software. So you notice that the types of components that you need to install are one, JSDK, Apache Maven, two, Apache Ant, three, Postgres, QA in our case, four, the servlet container, five, and then Git, six. In my case, uh, I would have really loved to use the, the clean instance, but in my case, I have already installed uh, Git. I already have Git installed. I don't have to install Git. Uh, I already have, uh, I hope I have Tomcat. I don't have Tomcat, so I'll have to install Tomcat, right? Uh, I'll have to install Postgres because I know I don't have Postgres installed. Installing these components is easy. In most instances, uh, the installation is, in all instances like this, installation is specific to the operating system. So the way that you install these components is different on Windows when compared to Linux, right? Because I'm working with Linux, I'd have to follow the instructions associated with Linux. So the DSpace manual itself, it will have details of, um, it will have details of where to go to install these different components. <clears throat> so we'll go through these step by step so that you see. JSDK. Uh, so you can, the JDK, JDK comes in so many different variants. There's Open JDK and then there's Oracle JDK. I do believe I have uh, Java installed. I'll be surprised if I don't. So I already have Open JDK installed, if you notice. So I don't need to install Open JDK. Um, I don't know if I have Apache, Apache Mervin, uh, Mervin installed, but I think I do. Nope, so I, is it Marvin or MVN actually? I think it's MVN. I should have this installed. Nope, I don't have Apache Marvin installed, so I'd have to install this, right? The way you install it, you notice that uh, under this section, which is Apache Marvin, in the table of contents, Apache Marvin is 3.3. .3. They recommend that you install either version 3.0.5 or above, right? Uh, so we're, go we're going to go to Apache Maven and uh, just a minute, I, see, I think I saw, oh, is it, okay. <clears throat> I saw a comment in the WhatsApp group, so I thought maybe I disconnected. I think it was someone informing our other colleagues that we have class, right? So. Well, Apache Maven, if you're using Linux, it's very easy to install this component, right? So I'll just say install Maven, right? Let me just try and see if I can. So that. I'll just install Maven. Oops, why am I doing that? I'll have to install Maven. This is how I get to install Maven. Now I want to be very careful that the, the Apache Maven that I'm installing here is going to is going to conform to what is being specified by deep, this uh, it's going to be specified in the manual you have to be very careful because the installation might fail because you're using the wrong version space to be on a safe side even if you're running linux maybe what you might want to do is instead of installing using the package manager 
you can just download Marvin from the link like they are indicating here. So you can download Marvin from this link. So I'll open this link. If I can just close these other things here because they're distracting, I think. I'm just gonna close this. So that we just have uh, things that we want actually. All right, so I've opened a new link for Patch Maven. Here it is. And then uh, because I'm installing this on, on Linux, I would have to make sure that I go for the binary that is specific to the operating system that I want to download. So the thing that I want to be certain about is that I'm installing the correct version, right? 3.3.9 plus. So I'll come here. 3.3.3.9 plus, I see that the current version is 3.6.3, so it's fine. Um, I'll just find the download link here. Um, then I should be able to find the binary file that I'm looking for here, which in this case would uh, have to be one of these, I guess. Okay, and just make sure that uh, There we go. Now, as this is downloading, uh, if you want to use the package manager, like I said, it's quite easy. So let me just, I'll install this and then try and see if uh, the version that I'm going to have access to is, is going to be above 3.3, .3 because that's the most important thing to do. Um, Wait for the download and then wait for this to install here. So this is just showing you how, how far away the installation process is. Um, should be done shortly. If the version that we are installing from the package manager, most Unix uh, operating systems will come, they have a package manager that make that, there are package managers that make it relatively easy to install software components. So you don't have to manually download software, you just issue a simple command to, to install the software and then automatically in the background, that software is downloaded from the source and then installed on your behalf, right? So you notice here that it's done. So I'll check the version of Marvin installed. And I see it's 3.6, perfect, right? So if it's 3.6, it's fine, because what this manual is saying is that I need to install 3.3.9 plus and above. So the version I have is fine, okay? I'll scroll down because after 3.3 .3 is 3.4. Now these other portions, I'm ignoring them because I don't have to configure a proxy. Usually you have proxies, uh, you have proxy servers that are used if you work uh, for a large organization, like most universities, it's a security mechanism. Right? so in the event that you need to specify a proxy server that you want to use to connect to the internet, you, you, you just go through this subsection here, 3.3.1 but I'm ignoring this because I don't need a proxy server myself. So I'll go to 3.4 where I install Ant, another software component. Again, for Ant, there's a link where you can download Ant, but fortunately for Unix platforms, you can install Ant, right? Uh, so you notice if I type Ant, my operating system will tell me to say, Ant is not installed, I can install Ant using this command here, right? Or I can use snap if I want to. I prefer apt-get myself for apt. So I'll just say apt-get install ant, and then it will install ant, right? I press enter. Again, I'm, I'm reaching here because I, I don't want to manually download the application and install it. I'd rather use a package manager, unless if the version of ant that I will install using the package manager is, is less than this version. Notice the requirement for this particular software component is that ANT should be version 1.8 or later. So 1.8 and above, right? I'll check the version of ANT that I've installed here. And you notice that, uh, and I guess ANT here is one, one hyphen, uh, 1.10, which is perfect because here ANT is supposed to be 1.8 and above. So I'm safe. Afterwards, I go to 
uh, component 3.5, which is the relational database management system. Now, currently, right, if you go to the RDBS component, they recommend that you, you use PostgreSQL or Oracle. But, but in actual fact, you can experiment with other relational database management systems. It's always nice to go with the recommendations. Um, in the past, we never have installed vSpace. I always install Postgres because PostgreSQL is free and open source. Oracle, you can't install Oracle for free. You need to pay a subscription. Very expensive, by the way, but extremely powerful database, right? So we will install PostgreSQL. But you notice that the requirement for PostgreSQL here is that it should be version 9.4 or later. Again, depending on the distro you're using, you can install PostgreSQL now. Installing PostgreSQL, you can either go here or you can look up, I guess, or look up how to install PostgreSQL uh, here or say uh, Postgres. Doc, how far have you gone? Uh, I've just joined the class. I used the wrong oh. link. Yeah, well, so we haven't gone far. We 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 are we haven't yet even started installing this space. We are oh. we've only looked at uh, prerequisites, so prerequisite hardware that you need. Which is prerequisite component. So you for you to install this space, you need to have certain prerequisite software components. So we haven't we haven't gone very far in other ways, you know. Okay, yeah. so, and some of these things really, they might not make sense and your role maybe might not really involve that you do this, but maybe you, you guide people in IT to say, go here and install these things, right? You don't, but for some of you, maybe you'll have to install these yourselves, I guess, I don't know. Uh, perfect. So for me to install Postgres, all I need is this command here. So, three dot, Three dot three dot five. We are installing the relational database management system, which is going to in part store the metadata. If you remember the way this space works, the way most of these digital library systems work is the bit streams are stored on the file system, but the metadata is stored in a relational database management system. Right. So we are going to install the relational database management system now, and I'll come here and I'll just uh, I'll I'll install. PostgreSQL, I should say. I, I'm hoping that the version of PostgreSQL I'm installing is going to be above the minimum required. You see this here. This space six requires Postgres 9.4 and above, right? And of course I need to install this particular, this PG crypto extension for Postgres. We'll do this after we install Postgres. So we'll wait here, uh, ooh. Oh, it looks like I already have post. Do I already have PostgreSQL? Okay, it appears I'm, I've, I've just installed PostgreSQL. Uh, so I will, I'll say PSQL to see if I've installed it. Oof, it is installed, I think. It is installed, I think. Okay, so we need to install it, start it, let's try and see. Active. Well, we have installed this, I'll just restart it. So we've installed, we've installed it, now you notice that after installing the thing, there is another component we need to install. Now there are, there are procedures that you go through for you to do this. This is all in the manual really. What I'm doing here is just reading the manual with you and just, illustrating, giving you, I guess, an example of what you'd have to do as you're installing this, if you want to install this. And by the way, you can actually, if you have a computer that has a specifications, you can install this on your personal computer so that you experiment with this on your own. The only thing you'd have to make sure is that your computer has a sufficient RAM, which is 2 GB of RAM, and you have sufficient disk space, which they said is about 20 GB at least and above. Okay, so we've installed uh, PostgreSQL, now we want to install this uh, so-called uh, PG crypto extension. This is an extension for, this is an extension for PostgreSQL, right? It is required and uh, it appears there, I hope there are instructions on how to do this here. 
I just have to go here. Or I suppose I can look up uh, Ubuntu 18.5G crypto. Right, so uh, you, so I'm trying to cut corners here because it turns out that it's a, it's a lengthy process, but I'm trying to cut corners, which is why I'm looking up information. I'm avoiding going to these links. There are links here, right? Links to where you can find details about these different subcomponents they're talking about, like this extension for PostgreSQL, for instance. All you do is um, just click on the link. If you're installing this on Windows, for you to install PostgreSQL on Windows, you just click this, this link here against this bullet here, which has windows, right? Uh, I was trying to cut corners here by just trying to see if I could find, uh, and this is an old version, I'm trying to see if I can find uh, the part where I get to install the crypto module. Um, also, maybe now would be the time to just check the version of Postgres, yes, here. This is 10, which is good enough, I guess. Version 10 that I've just installed, if you notice the requirement for PostgreSQL is supposed to be 9.4 and above. So 10 is good enough. The only thing I have to do now is install the PG crypto extension. Uh, and I'm trying to see if I can quickly find an easier way of installing this, okay. That's a good enough answer. So, for me to, to do this, I would have to first of all create the database. So I'll leave this for now and I'll do it later. So I'll go back here, right? Uh, PostgreSQL, which is here. Uh, there are other details that you need to make sure, make sure that uh, there's support for this. Uh, once installed, you need to enable TCP connections to this specific GDP. Okay, uh, let's see. So for me to do this bullet point here, for me to work towards this bullet point here, you notice that the instructions on what I need to do. All I need to do is configure this file in such a way that I comment the link that has this, the, the, the text that has this. So I will just, uh, I don't know if I can find uh, locate Postgres. Where is Postgres? So I will, if I can locate this file. I'm looking for this file, this PostgreSQL config file, because this is where I need to make that change that is specified against this bullet point. Uh, it hasn't yet been indexed. So I would take a leap of faith here and assume that it's maybe in the lib directory. It's in version 10. Uh, not in here. So I'm just trying to find location of uh, this. Maybe it's in etc. PostgreSQL. There we go. I think it's in here. So this is the file I'm looking for. According to the instructions, I just need to edit this file and then change or uncomment. You'll notice what I'm doing here is I'm just following the instructions in here, right? So you don't really need to know what you are doing. Um, you just need to, if you can read, right? And I, I don't know if this is something that makes sense, but if you can read English, then you should be able to follow through these instructions. Now, granted, it might take you a while because you'll probably be doing this for the first time, but it, it might take slightly longer than what I'm doing right now. In certain instances, maybe more than one day or something, but, <clears throat> but that's neither here nor there. So I've uncommented this and then they're saying here that we tighten up security, right? In this file by adding this line. I'm just going to follow through with the instructions here. I'll find PG under bar hba.config, it's in the same location, I'm sure, this file here. Then I'll just edit this as well, so that I get in the security by adding this line. Uh, 
And actually, in this case, we can, we, can, we can skip this line because there's no need for me to type in security, so it should be able to work. I don't have to type in security anymore because I'm now running this as a sandbox anyway. So the thing here, right, what I've been doing is just installing and configuring this component, the relational database management system. Configuration of the relational database management system, the steps you follow are dependent on which specific type of relational database management system you're going to install. I mentioned that I'm using Postgres because it's freely available and open source. If you have access to Oracle, if your organization has access to Oracle, which is the case for some organizations, large organizations like universities, I suppose, then you follow these instructions here, okay? The next component, 3.6, is a servlet container. Sorry, servlet, yes, servlet container, right? So the application that is going to use to run this space. Right, so the instructions here, they're saying the requirement is it must be Tomcat version eight, right? Uh, so version seven and above actually it's saying. Version seven and above here. So let's see if we can install, uh, I'm trying to see if there are issues to do with, okay, there are bugs to do with version eight here. So we'll install Tomcat version seven. I'll just, sorry, I'll just say install. Tomcat, and because I'm using an operating system that is, uh, and I don't have Tomcat version seven, then I'll just install version eight here. <clears throat> right, so I'm going to install Tomcat version eight and hope that it will work. So these, these, these are exclamation marks here, just highlighting the fact that there are issues, there are specific issues associated with Tomcat version eight. Um, but if it's a bug, I'm sure the application should be able to run without a problem. Okay. So this may take a while, just wait for this to finish. Uh, again, a reminder that we are installing this component. These are prerequisite software tools we're installing. And we are now installing 3.6, which is a servlet engine. We've chosen to use Tomcat, Apache Tomcat. You could have used Jet if you want to. Um, I prefer to use Tomcat because it can be used in production environment. And also because I've worked with it in the past. So I'm, I'm slightly familiar with it, right? Uh, so just wait for this to finish. You should be able to finish very soon. Proposal as we're waiting, maybe just ask if people are following through if this is making sense. Or you want us to pause and just cancel this or something? I don't know. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> I don't think it would take that long. Uh, it should be done very soon, by the way. <clears throat> so I'll check if uh, Homecart has been installed and it's running. And the way that I'll check if it's running and has been installed is I'll just go to localhost because remember I'll talk with Dr. Thierry, localhost is by current machine. So if I just say put 80, I see it works and I know that Tomcat has been installed, right? <clears throat> um, and it's put 80, 80, right? Afterwards, what I do now is I go to, Tomcat has been installed. I still go here to see if there are any specific things I need to do. You're telling me that I need to change ownership to the, okay, I'll need to change ownership to the dispatch uh, thing that I'll need to do. I'll scroll up here slightly to see if I've missed out anything beforehand. For the impatient, I haven't. <coughs> haven't. I'll scroll down again to Tomcat, which is here. So they're just telling us here that we change ownership to, um, you might, sometimes you run into issues to do with ownership. Uh, because different operating system users will, will run different components of things related to this space. So for instance, there's a user called Postgres that runs the Postgres, Postgres database, right? Tomcat has its own user. So you want to make sure that you are very careful and very meticulous when you're specifying which users have access to what. We might need to come back to this or we'll just run it in, in super user mode. That's not a problem. So we can skip this for now. Right, um, this is what they're saying at this point. So one option is we can assign, uh, we can change the owner of the, uh, the folder where we're going to install this space. We can assign it to the user Tomcat, 
or we can just run it as a dispersed user. We we'll just run it as a dispersed user, which is fine. And then they are saying here that we modify this in such a way that uh, trying to see if it's to be necessary for us to modify these things. Perhaps not for now, actually. Let's see, this this you would only have to worry about this in production mode, I guess. Um, yeah, no need to. We can skip this. I'm looking at time. So we can skip this. I want us to get to the part where we're installing dispersed rather than the prerequisite software components because the way that you install the prerequisite software components will be different depending on which operating system you're using. But installing dispersed is the same, whether you're using um, whether you're using Windows or whether you're using Unix. Right? So just for now, I think we can skip this. I hope uh, we haven't skipped anything important. I don't think so. Just in case, I think I'll just uh, try and see if we can do the right thing. I'll just uh, search for Tomcat 8, and uh, I think it should be in version 8 here. <clears throat> and I do hope this configuration, the config file that we want is, uh, is it in Catalina or is it this localhost? Probably not. It's fine. I want to make sure it's in the correct folder. I'm just going to do where it is. It. And see if it's in here. I think it should be in here then. Okay, so I'm going to just assume that we are editing the correct file, which is the server file, I think we are. And then make this change here, that they're saying here that you need to alter the different configuration to support searching and browsing. Actually, we can omit this, it's not that important. I'll omit it. Uh, scroll down. We are done with the configuration of uh, We are done installing this Git installed, <clears throat> right? Um, it's nothing more than a vision control piece of software. So it allows you to keep track of what sort of changes you're making on a project. Um, okay, and then now the installation, the actual installation instructions. So we've installed the prerequisite components, and then now the actual dispersed instru instructions. So there are two, two different distributions that you use to install dispersed. It's either you can install it, you can use the binary or the source. When you use the source, you literally have to build this space on your own, which is a bit uh, involving. You're better off uh, using the binary release. <clears throat> uh, so this is what we're going to, to use. And then uh, we now want to, we've chosen that this is what we're going to use. At a later stage, there's a link where we get to download this file. Right, so this, the file will download will be literally this space hyphen 6.3 hyphen release.zip because we are going to install version 6.3. Uh, so I'm going to scroll down. Um, and then before we begin the installation, they're telling us that uh, we need to familiarize ourselves with these things here. So there's a naming convention as they're explaining the installation process. Anything that is referred to as this space in the square brackets is the installation directory. Anything referred to as dispersed hyphen source is the source directory. Um, uh, and then the web deployment directory is going to be the installation directory slash web apps. Right. Okay, so the actual installation. Um, before that, you see here they're saying step number one is we create the user, quite easy in Unix. We we'll literally just come here and uh, get that user. So we now have uh, the dispersed user created. Um, <clears throat> and then we download the latest release. There's a link to where you download dispersed from. Now they are loosely saying release, latest release because this, these versions of software change multiple times in a year. 
But if you remember, the current beta release is seven, but I mentioned that we're installing 6.3, which is a stable release. So I'll scroll down to 6.3, for 6.3, and here we are. And I mentioned that we are going to install the binary release. So I'll expand the assets link here and download this base, this base hyphen 6.3 hyphen release.zip. Uh, to make it a lot easier, I'm just going to create a project code work, you know, just call this uh, literally MSC uh, is 5310. So, so I'll create this and then I'll download the file from within here. Make life a lot easier, I'll just use the big get, right? So once I, it's a small file because the building, like I said, is done online, right? You'll soon see what I mean here. So I've downloaded the, the binary release for version 6.3. .3. And then what I'm going to do now is uh, go to step number three where and unpack this. I'll just unzip this. I'm going to pause and just ask if people are following. I don't know if they're following. Maybe I'm talking to myself or something. Uh, are people still there or something? Oh. Yes, though. Oh, okay. Right. So I'll unzip this. Uh, I'll, I'm just compress I'm compressing it. So I've, I'm just following the instructions. I've unzipped it. This, this is what I have. Right. And when I unzip it, yeah, what I've unzipped is what is referred to on top here. This is what is referred to as a source. Right. This is a dispatch hyphen source in square brackets. So the instructions will be making reference to these things. So square brackets. Uh, so you have to be careful about this. Okay, um, I'll scroll down. I've, un I've, I've gone to step number is it two or three. I've unpacked, right? Uh, there are different instructions depending on which format you've downloaded. I've chosen zip. You could have used uh, the gzip format or bz, right? Uh, zip is more familiar anyway. And then now the database setup, right? Step number four. Uh, we've already installed the database, and the first thing we need to do here is. Uh, uh, Okay, blah, blah, blah. We need to create a dispatch service user. Now observe, what we created here when I, when I ran this command, right, was the, was the OS user, the operating system user called the dispatch. When I did this, when I did this, what we need to do now is create database user called dispatch. Uh, okay, I'll just have to log in into Postgres. Then I will create this user. Okay, so I've created the user, I'll log out again. Once we create the dispatch user, uh, we've been prompted the password twice, and now we'll have to create the database, right? Which will be owned by this user here database user. So I'll create the database, this space. I'll go back and I foolishly did that. I should have just done this and I'll create database. Done, right? Once I create this database, and, and there's ways of figuring out if you've created a database, by the way, you can literally, I hope it will be able to PSQL. If I list the databases, you notice that I've created the DSpace database here. It's empty right now, I haven't done anything. I just created database, right? Uh, I'll quit, go back here. So I've created a database. Uh, we must enable this extension. And they're telling us how exactly we need to enable this extension. So it's li literally all you do is you copy this. I shouldn't have exited into that user. I'll do that. I've created the extension. You notice, all I'm doing is just following these instructions, copy paste really, which is not that hard. Um, so we didn't return any result, so we know that it succeeded if you look at this. There's an alternative way of uh, configuring or enabling this uh, PG crypto extension, but we've gone the easy route, which is quite easy, just copy paste these commands. In a production environment, you want to be very careful about some of these things because they'll prevent 
the likelihood of your repository being hacked. Uh, Zachary, uh, on Wednesday, I hope you, mention, you mentioned this, you always mention this, there was a time when the UNSA repository was hacked. So these are, if, if, I'm skipping some of the steps, but there are important steps that need careful attention. Make sure that you're doing the correct thing. And people in IT will know how to do this. This is not applicable because we are not dealing with Oracle, we're dealing with PostgreSQL. Done. Step number five is we, we, we work on the initial local.cfg, the configuration file. So you notice they are telling us we go to this directory here. And this is the source directory where you've unpacked this space. So I will go here, I've unpacked it here, and the directory I need to go into is this space config, right? So I'll say this space config in here. Then I'll just open the local file. I'll rather rename this local example to local file. So I'll, uh, I have to do this, right? You see this? Simply, they're saying, uh, just simply copy copy across this file, local.cfg.example. I'll just come here and then I'll say local.cfg, copy local.cfg to local.cfg, boom. So, uh, okay, and then once I do that, uh, you said you must copy it into this, that's fine. So once I do that, um, for initial installation of this space, there's some key requirements you may want to override. Okay. So we just need to make sure that we change these, right? These are the important things you, you need to change because this default file might have information that um, Information that needs to be changed to install this space into. To avoid confusion, I'm just gonna install this in the same location as this. I'll install it in here. I'll just name it this space. Okay? And then I'll come to this space. And then just copy this directory here. This is what I want to feed into here. Okay. I'll come back here and uh, open the local file. And then under this space, this is a dispatch directory here, dispatch to dir, the dir. I'll just replace this thing here, if you notice this, line number 31, like this. Save the file. The other thing that is required to change is, you see, the things that you, you are changing are these, the things that really require careful thinking are the ones with the asterisks, right, these stars. So I'll check the base URL to see if, uh, in my, in my case, I'll just go with local host because I'm installing it on my local machine. But if it's in a production environment, this would be like uh, unilas dot, uh, dispatch dot unilas dot sc dot, Z, dot zm or something, right? I'll leave that. Database name is fine. Apache Solar Server, probably leave this as um, the way it is. Local host is fine because I'm installing it on my local machine. The DB URL. I'll probably leave it as it is as well because I'm, I'm guessing I'm, yeah, it's fine. I'm guessing I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm uh, the installation was done on my local machine. So all of the, all the defaults are just fine. Okay, so the default here is Postgres, but if you were using Oracle, you'd have to change this, right? So this is fine. Dialect, uh, let's see this. I have no idea what this is, I've forgotten, but let's see what this is all about. Okay, Postgres is fine, right? So if you're using Oracle, you'd use a different, a different value. Uh, username. Database, these are the database usernames. Now, if you remember, what I was doing was I was using defaults, which is this space, this space, so this is fine as well. But in an ideal case, you would not use the default passwords. You would have to use, uh, uh, I guess, passwords that you know uh, people wouldn't easily guess, right? 
See my name? It's probably going to be this space because I've named it this space. Okay. Oh, let just quick public, I guess. No, this schema name is actually this space because we named it this space. Okay. Uh, these are things, these are not important. They don't have the, the star or the asterisk. <clears throat> these are to do with, um, you see what, what happens in this space is that, um, is that um, sometimes you need emails to be automatically generated when something new is submitted. So you need to configure uh, email servers. For now, we we'll just ignore this. Okay. So done, right? I don't know if people are still around. Maybe not, maybe, I don't know. So. Have I lost connection or are people still there, by the way? I've lost connection. Okay, so there's someone following at least, which is fine. And so I'm just changing permissions like uh, they, ooh, like they are suggesting there. They're suggesting that we change permissions to this directory, right? We give it to this space. Okay, so let's change the permissions Let's to this space. I could just as well have just said this space, this space here actually. But, uh, so that uh, so that this is owned by this space. The user this space. <coughs> okay. And then now we do the packaging with Marvin, right? So this is where the Marvin part comes into play. And I'm just going to check if I have enough data here because I'm using my I suppose. <clears throat> okay, so you notice that the, that the instructions say we change directly into this space source. Now, if you remember, this space source is this space source is here. This. So whilst in here, they are saying we issue this command. Okay. So we just issue this command, and then boom. So this is where the building is being done on the fly online, right? So. The different components are being pulled from 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 the internet essentially, um, and uh, in the past it hasn't really taken that long. I'm not sure how long this is going to take. Normally, it does take quite a bit of time, depend, depending on how fast your internet connection is. Um, just trying to see how much data I have, and, and it it actually consumes quite quite a bit of data here. So uh, you just sit back and you wait for this to be done. Um, I think I have sufficient. All right. <clears throat> so as we are pulling these uh, components, I'm just I'm just going to ask if uh, people have uh, any particular questions here. And I know this is like one of those crash courses for, I guess, installing this space. It would take. This normally works quite well when you're leveraging a workshop workshop type style interaction where people are working through these things on their own. And then when you, you, you hit a, a stumbling block, right? You, someone walks over to you and they guide you. So, uh, I don't know if it would be helpful to watch someone do this installation. Maybe what would be helpful is if you are testing this out on your own, you download this recording and then you start playing it back to see if, uh, to see if you can follow through. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe. So are, are there any questions, maybe concerns? And... Is this making sense or? Mm. Is, this, is, is this making sense? Or is it, are, are, you able, are, are you able to pick up a few things? You can, not everything might make sense, but 
are you able to pick out make sense out of what you would have what would have to be done I don't know if people are still there, but I know if um yes, dog, we are. We are yeah. following. It, it out, this is a. It's not. Uh, maybe a, yes, we are following. Okay. Yeah. It's, so it's just that uh, this is uh, more like taking apart. Yeah. Where you know things to do with uh, like the technical because it's done in the background and we don't really see what goes on. Yes, so maybe but, this, but what uh, you should be able to, what you should be able to do though is that um, you see when you go to someone in IT, the people in IT work with so many different things. You should be able to direct people in IT to say, "This is the application you want to install. This is where yeah. you find information. These are some of this, this is where you'll be able to find information, useful information about this." At the very least, you should be knowledgeable of what would be required, I guess. But also these days, right? You should also be able to install these things. It's a I don't At know. Least it's about the, the operating system. In your case, you said you use the Ubuntu, yeah. and you needed uh, to, to 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 look at uh, the. You can either use uh, the, the the Unix, yes, or or Microsoft Windows. At least there we are following, and then you are you are saying just a matter of reading, it will direct you what to do as you read and direct you what to do. Yes, and the reason I said that I is, is because if you notice, what I was doing was I was just copy pasting commands from the manual, from the documentation. Yes. So if you have like a manual and then you've gotten these skills, at least that you, if, if you've gotten these skills and then there is a manual and then you also have uh, you followed what you are doing, looking at the operating system, yeah. looking at uh, these other factors. I think when we read, we, we can we can go, we, we can reach you know somewhere. Yeah, it's it's not. Um, yeah, I think, and it turns out on Windows, I think uh, it's much easier to install some of these things because in Windows, instead of you typing some of these commands on the terminal, it's just double clicking. You download something and then you double click, and then the installation of these components is similar to how you would install Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office, right? So, but, but in case you're not aware, the vast majority of servers where you have these applications installed. So if you have a core high instance, for instance, installed of UFind or, or some other obscure application, it will likely be installed on a Unix-like operating system. They're perfect for that, right? And also because they're, most of these are free, available, and open source software, right? For Windows, you, it's either you, you illegally download the software, like a Windows Server software, or you have to pay money, licensing fees, right? So which is why the vast majority of these applications are typically stored on Unix-like operating systems. It doesn't have to be Ubuntu, it could be Debian, it could be Red Hat, uh, I just happen to have a preference for Ubuntu. But, but, but this, um, and I know maybe for starters, it might, there are certain parts that might be a bit intimidating, but when you do have time, if you just sit and, and you start working through the steps, you'll be surprised. I mean, you should you'll be able to do this without a problem. But uh, I'm not sure, this thing is not telling us how far it's gone, but uh, usually it takes quite a bit of time. The things we are pulling here, a lot of components, right? Uh, because you, you, you download them offline and then you build the application. Um, once you're done building the application, you deploy the display software components. So I, I hope, uh, I hope we should be done very, very soon. Are there any other things that maybe you've picked up that you think uh, or things that are a bit un unclear about what we are doing as we are waiting for this thing to finish. No. Yeah, uh, let's see. Do you notice anything as we are waiting for this to, it's normally takes time, I've forgotten how long it takes. But uh, I wanted to find out if, uh, I think we're almost done, maybe. But I wanted to find out if people have any thoughts with the presentation that was given. Any 
anything peculiar that stood out that maybe something that you think is worth talking about? No. Okay. Uh, I'm hoping this is going to finish very, very soon, but uh, I hope so. Let me see this output here. It would be nice if we just go to a stage where we, had, we deploy the applications. Um, test resources. But let's just wait and see. I think we're almost done because we have portions where we are, we are building this space. If you notice, I don't know if you notice this, this part. Yeah, we're almost there. <clears throat> and it turns out, right, so, very, very soon, some of you that are, those of you that are working for institutions of higher learning, for instance, not just institutions of higher learning, but those of you that are found, uh, will find themselves working with other tools, other, I guess what tools you might, that might fall under library, uh, integrated library systems or something, you undergo the same process. Because installation of Koha, ViewFind, it's a similar process. All of these are, web-based applications, they are content management systems. They have a database backend that you have to install and configure before you install the application. And then they have the actual application that was implemented. So you download the application, you download the software prerequisite components, and then you deploy the application or you install the application. So once you learn how to play around with one type of web application, it becomes relatively easy to do, um, to do the same thing to a different type of application. Uh, but in certain instances, maybe you might not, oh, I think we're almost there. You might not need to, to know the gory details of what goes on behind the scenes, but, but maybe you should be knowledgeable of the process uh, so that you can easily direct people that are able to do this. You tell them this is what needs to be done. Um. Anyway, maybe as this is running, I'm going to be checking this. Uh, I don't know if people are gotten bored or they're still there. I see we have eight now. But what I'm going to do, right, is uh, just because this is taking a bit of time, I'm not sure how, how, far, how far along we are here, but what I want to do is to just give us a simple walkthrough of what we need to do for us to work with the, um, with the demo, this space instance. Now the slides, beginning, Beginning um, slide number one, 179 or 178, they have details of uh, how you get to interact with this space if you have not done this before. Or if you have, it might be nice to look at how you get to interact with the most recent version. So there's a demo instance that is available here, right? So you just go to demo.dispace.org. No need to install this space there. You go to demo.dispace.org, and then from there, you, you have access to credentials, password, usernames, and password for, for ad, 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 accounts with, uh, user accounts with administrative privileges, and user accounts with uh, normal privileges. So user accounts that will allow you to deposit content, for instance. That way you're able to experiment with this space. I do encourage you to go for uh, user accounts that uh, this is still building. I do encourage you to go for, to go for, uh, where is that thing? To go for the demo account that allows, I didn't open this. Go for the demo account that has admin privileges because you'll be able to do everything you want to do. Uh, the first thing you need to do once you go to demo.dispace.org is you choose which interface you want to use. You can either go for what Zcast is using, that JSP UI, I don't know if you remember that, it looks like this, uh, or if you want, you can play with the Cocoon, right, which is XML UI interface. So you click on that, and then somewhere at the bottom, once this is loaded, you will find the credentials you need, these things here. Right, so credentials will be here. So using these credentials, usernames, if you want to log in as site administrator, you log in with this username. If you want to log in as a community administrator, you use this username. If 
you want to log in as a collection administrator sys username or if you want to log in as a demo submitted sys username i do encourage you to log in with something with uh, higher privileges which is this right as an admin uh, so you just go up here and you log in right you log in from here the password is this space all our case right then once you log in you should be able to do whatever it is you want to do. You can walk through and uh, try and see if you can create some sample structures, hierarchical structure, maybe something similar to this or something similar to uh, things you do at work, right? You can make make up uh, anything. This thing is still. A bit of time. In fact, then if you want, you can. So once you log in as an administrator, you notice that you have access to so many different features here. Um, you should be able to play around with. Uh, I don't know if this allows you to change the profile, edit it in such a way that I, I, maybe it's it's not possible because uh, so you can change this demo university of Zambia or something, right? As a first name, last name administrator university or administrator or can call this demo please 53 administrator right so these are things that you would uh, you'll find yourself doing once you set up the dispatch right because you create multiple usernames and those people would have those their details would have to be provided like uh, uh, descriptive names, for instance, of different people. So an organization like UNSA, for instance, uh, allows, you, you, can, you can request that, you can request that the profile be created. It's done, profile information updated. You notice it's changed here. So that you are able to log in and update things on your own. So if you're an organization that wants to implement self-archiving, you obviously come up with a policy that makes it possible for accounts to be created for users so that they're able to deposit content on their own. If I log into the UNSA repository, you notice that I can only deposit content in the faculty that I'm a part of, right? Faculty that I'm a part of, if I click on start submission here, the collection that I can just submit content into is here, right? Um, and then you're able to go through the, the workflow itself. So you can work through some of these uh, additional things we have in this slide. This is taking time, why? Uh, some of these uh, pages here from page 178, edit the profile, um, like so. Uh, you can attempt to create a new community, which is quite easy really, using the demo itself. Uh, you just go to communities and collections, and then you, you, you can make up a sort of hierarchical structure. The idea is for you to be able to create sample communities and collections and be able to ingest a few objects so that you familiarize yourself with the ingestion workflow, right? So from here, I could uh, come through and say, I want to, I want to create a community right, under this context. And then I'll call this community uh, list 5310, or well, I'll call it 2019, 2020, list 310. This could be anything. Uh, you, you want to be careful, you don't use sensitive information because this demo instance is used by a lot of people, right? So make sure that uh, if the sensitive information that you're using as a demo, you you, you you omit it, right? And you notice that as I'm creating that collection, if I open an incognito window and access this interface, I will be able to see, wow, this is taking a while. Okay. I will be able to see that collection. Observe, scroll down, communities and collections. I should be able to see the least thing here somewhere, I hope this thing I've just created here. So this community has no collections. After I create a, a community, the structure in this space is simple. It's centered around communities and collections. 
level one structure is always a community. You can, you can only ingest content into a collection. You can have optionally sub communities, or you can have level two collections. You can have sub collections if you want, but the idea is content is ingested into a collection. So observe, once we create this 20, 20, 19, 20, 20 co community, we can then create uh, a collection into this community, right? Uh, all you have to do is go into here, click into this community, whilst logged in as administrator, scroll down and choose to either create a sub-community, right? Or create a collection. In this case, we just create a collection. If you create a sub-community, then that, what that means is that you're creating a structure where you will not be able to deposit content. So in this case, we'll just call this collection digital libraries module, right? Making these things up, I'm just showcasing what you would find yourself doing as you are playing around with this demo instance. Uh, now the other things that you include like nice images, if you want to configure the repository so that it's visually appealing, observe like how the open UCT repository looks like, how open Salbro, I wonder if the guys from open UCT they have changed. If you wanted to have nice images, the collection and the communities, if you want them to be representative of your schools, you do this, right? We're still using this thing we created many, many years ago, which is fine. Um, but for now, we're just using a description here, and then we'll just say, create the collection. Check if this is done, not yet. <clears throat> We've created a collection, and then you notice that the other slides that you'll be following through here is just nothing more than creating the actual, uh, ingesting an actual, an actual digital object. So once you create, once you're satisfied with the structure and you have a collection or sub collection, you can then go to that collection, right? Go to that particular collection. So you go to the homepage if you want, if that makes it a lot easier, click the community on the homepage when you're logged on. When you're logged on, you go to the collection, which is community, which is here, click on that. Inside here, you will find a collection which we've created. You can have multiple collections, you click in that, you can then insert something. You see you have this start a new item, submit a new item. Once you click this, you then go through that submission workflow where you are ingesting content, right? Example, uh, oof. Oh, I don't know what to call this, this is a, uh, oh, we'll call this Mlinga, uh, uh, among or something, right? All right, so then we say, example, uh, this 5310 module or something. Right, um, and then you, you start going through the submission workflow. Now the idea behind the slides that I had there was to, to just enable you it turns out for you to understand some of the things we are discussing, you will need to at least attempt to do this if you have never done this before. Because it will help consolidate these different things that we are talking about to do with metadata especially. It needs a year, right? So, boom, and then we we'll go next. I hope we're almost done here. Then you have your subjects here. If you want, you can look up information from uh, a controlled vocabulary set, which by default, I guess, oh, it's not here, in here. You click on subject categories by default. I, I don't know which controlled vocabulary set is integrated with um, this space by default, but there is something, it's generic really. It's not coming up, I wonder why. But anyway, you do that and then example, abstract. Um, then you go next. So the idea really is what, what, what the idea behind the so-called practical walkthrough I was talking about is to enable you familiarize yourself with the submission workflow and to appreciate, if you haven't done this before, to appreciate 
the complex nature of the submission workflow. So I'm just gonna upload uh, something that's not sensitive. And, uh, oh, I'll upload the job advertisement for the investor of Zambia. They're looking for a librarian apparently. Now I'm gonna go next. And it's still downloading here. And then boom, it's done, right? I, I verify these things uh, and then I say next. Specify licensing information. I'll just create creative commons, right? Uh, go to next. And then the thing though is that uh, I'll say no commercial use, right? Attribution, yes, share alike. The, the thing here is that uh, if you are going to be playing with the demo instance, you want to be aware of the fact that uh, the information is paged every day because there are a lot of people that use this. So you will not find this two days from now, the information that you put in here. So please, 193. See if you can familiarize yourself with the workflow itself. So done, and then once you're done just in this, if you view this, you'll be able to see that there's one item in this collection. Hopefully you should, should be able to see that there's one item. And I'm wondering why it's not there yet. It should, it should indicate one. I don't know if it's an indexing thing. Did we, I think we created it in the correct one. I'm wondering why it's not coming up. It should appear, it should have appeared. Uh, this is taking quite a bit, I was hoping it wasn't going to take this long, but wondering, um, is this making a bit of sense or I'm rambling on my own here? So. Is, is this, uh, I can't remember who requested the, for us to do the installation. I was sus suspecting it wasn't going to be that uh, help, especially the sort of interaction we've been having. But when you have, um, you know, when you have like a workshop, face-to-face -face interaction, you can clearly cut this out as a workshop where people are actually doing this stuff and then you help them out. Helping people out remotely is usually a bit of a pain. Um, is this, is this making sense though? Or not? Don't know if I'm still around. I think people have left, probably. Well, I'll just, uh, in case people have left or they've muted this, I will try and see if I can attempt to finish the install. Yeah, we're following. Like person I've been following, oh, okay. except um, the the process is quite uh, tedious uh, from what I can see. So it's quite a lot of time to, to go through. It is. But the, like I said, once you learn this process, once you learn one process, uh, and I'm speaking this from experience, the first time I installed this space myself, many, many years ago, I was 2011. It was very painful. It took me, I think it took me two days or something. Right, and I already had some sort of a uh, uh, comprehensive IT background, right? Um, well, maybe a day actually, not two days. But the thing is, once you, you do it for one type of application, it becomes easier for you to install other applications like uh, Fedora Commons, for instance, if it ever came to that. If you work for an organization that tells you to say, we want, we now have decided as, a, as an institution to start setting up journals online, You'll be able to set up this easy. We did this in the department. This is the journals. You see the journals that people usually OJS is a platform that is a platform of choice, really. Very easy, right? Uh, in fact, much simpler process than this space anyway. So, but the key thing is once you learn how to install one type of component, it becomes very easy for you to do the other. Right? I guess depending on what your role is at work, uh, it becomes a useful skill. But I know. Most of you are probably at a level where you are less involved with these things, right? It's middle management or upper management, in which case maybe you'll be directing people, but you still need to be familiar with this process, right? 
who knows, maybe you are part of the, a committee that's hiring people, you want to be able to ensure that the, the people I suppose you are hiring are able to do these things. Right? If you're hiring a system librarian, you should be able to, to determine whether or not someone is able to do these things, right? Um, and you're able to, you'll be able to ask some of these questions if you are at least knowledgeable in the area. But also it's a way of, it's fun, I think, to do these things, in my opinion. Um, yeah, but please, uh, for the, mo the modules, please go through these slides from the walkthrough, the practical walkthrough from 178, so that you at least, if you have never had experience with this space, it will help you understand the things we talked about, the DC terms, for instance, Dublin Core, and perhaps some of the things that were presented in today's talk, in fact, is in the talk that's going to be presented on um, Wednesday. I think my connection is, uh, I don't know if the display installation process has uh, changed. It, it, it previously, I don't, I don't remember it taking this long. I don't know what, I think it should be my connection maybe. What am I downloading? I don't know if it's my connection. It should be my connection because if I'm, if I'm downloading 98 megabytes of data and it's, it's pro I think it's my connection. I hope, I hope we're almost done. If I was doing this on the UNSA, uh, campus or on the Unza network, it was going to be super fast, right? Uh, this thing is uh, taking time, right? We're now building the rest. So rest. I think this is the, this is the part where you start praying to God, say, please God, let this quickly finish because it's 1915 and we're wasting time. But I don't know if God would help with installation. Maybe I don't know. Uh, but but I, but anyway, seeing as we are, by the way, we've literally wrapped up um, our discussion of module number six. Very very soon we start module number seven. Uh, I was of the view that we start module number seven, maybe uh, give you time to brood a little. We start Thursday, Friday, and then maybe hope to finish by Friday, or maybe we give you time to. I'm looking at, I was thinking, the reason I have invited Zachary, I've invited uh, Abel to give a talk. I was of the view, I would like for you to discuss this as a group. I know that this is part, you have other courses. So, but I want to give you time to, uh, I think, think about some of the things we've discussed before we transition to information retrieval, because the, the la while the last module is not really technically intensive per se, we typically focus on automation factors and whatnot. But the information retrieval component has, it's, we don't want it, but it, it requires a little bit of thinking, especially if you don't have an IR background. So what I was thinking we do is uh, the talks this week, actually, of the talks Wednesday and Thursday, and then we continue Thursday, I mean Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, and then we'll finish because the last talk is on Monday which is linked to, I guess, to certain extent, integrated library management systems. So maybe think about this. Uh, the initial plan was to do these things back to back, but maybe we can spread them out so that Wednesday and Thursday we just have talks and then we resume Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then Monday we we will we'll be done, I guess. Whoa. I, I don't know if people have any thoughts. I know I said we would think we would, you would talk about this as a group, but do you have any personal preferences on how we can do this? Good evening, Doc. Yes, hi. Hello. Maybe as we are deciding on that, we yes. we were talking to Dr. Ak earlier today, uh -huh. and he suggested that he wants to take us through research, and the appropriate time is the same time, 18 to 20. So he suggested if you may share some days with him. Okay, which which days does he want? Maybe three days. Hello, hello, Doc. Well, it's at your discretion yeah. since you started with us earlier, yeah. but he yeah. said suggested maybe if we can get four days, then we give him three days. Hello, okay. hello. Oh yes, hello. Harry. Do you want to contribute to what? Uh, Ms. Matilda was saying, yes, hi. Okay, Matilda, I don't know if you were there. If I, my memory serves me right, he must have mentioned that uh, he's going to wait for you to finish 
because he might not be there this week though this week up to next week so he can start after you finish maybe next week for him we okay. were saying he's going to wait for you to finish then he's going to start next week probably choose the if it's going to be available that's what he said mm. okay. yeah okay then then if uh that's the case then that's um we can uh we can accelerate this we'll finish what you just uh, suggested that uh, if we can finish maybe Monday, that yeah. would be okay because you you will going to start after you've already finished. Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, and unfortunately, this just happened here. With the build has failed for some weird reason. Did not find artifact. So, anyways, I, I I think this this thing. I don't know if we can find. There's an error here. There's a build failure. So the, the entire process sort of like failed. So and this happens a lot. I think we skip a number of important um, important processes, uh, which is why. I do believe, uh, I'm wondering what, I do believe this gives you an idea of what you have to go through. So if that process had had, had worked without a problem, uh, if we didn't have the build failure, we would not. Hmm. I think it's probably because if if this problem was not there, we would have successfully installed this space, right? Built this space. Um, and then we'll be done with the process. Let me see if we can quickly, we still have a bit of time. Let me see if we can quickly find a fix to this. Um, yep, it's still similar. This is not. This is not true, actually. I don't think this is going to work. It's unfortunate, uh, very unfortunate, but I want to start. Uh, I, I actually thought uh, you were almost done with Dr. Candelo. I, I didn't know that. Uh, I was under the impression that you're almost done with Dr. Candelo. I didn't know that you hadn't started going through this. I'm surprised. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Has the date been set for your proposal presentation or not yet? Let's see if we can. Anyway, this uh, would have to, I'm not sure why this error occurred. I'd have to look it up. We skipped a lot of things, which is why it's becoming difficult to figure out exactly what we did wrong. Let me see if this is. Yep, there are a lot of wrong things here. It 
still getting the error actually. Uh, let me see if we can find this uh, on the It would be nice if this went smoothly. Oh, the other thing is uh, if you were installing a platform like Omeka, you'd see how easy it would be. And what we are going through right now is tied to the features that you, or the process you go through to figure out which platform you want to install, right? Is the administration and installation configuration process easy? Do you have the expertise? Um, <clears throat> so, mm. maybe it's because uh, I might have an idea of why this is happening. Let me just change the. Uh, <clears throat> If I can change this, and I've forgotten how to change this, so which is why I'm, I'm, I'm looking, the, I'm looking up this information. I have to change. I might be using a, a different. Uh, different type of. Guess I'm not. Let's see if I can use. This is what I'm looking for. Java. Nope, I'm still I'm using the correct one, which is this. Okay, I'll put the file change. Hmm. <clears throat> I apologize for the breaking transmission. I, I think I, I hope we'll be able to find this solution to this. Maybe let me just check. There's a component that we GDK. Marvin. Not quite here. Yeah, if we can. So what I'm doing here is just trying to see if I can find a quick solution online. You should be able to find it. Instead of uh, the opposite will probably take a bit of extra time. 
So I'm trying to see if I can quickly find a fix for this. I should be able to find it soon, I hope. If not, then we'll just call it a night, but uh, should be able to. I do apologize for this, but hopefully you should be able to find uh, out what's happening soon. Let's see if we can find this. So what I'm doing is I'm going to change the version of Java uh, to eight, <clears throat> so that we, we check to see version. <clears throat> we check to see if uh, this will work. Okay, eight. Eight. Let's see here. We, we skipped a lot of we skipped a lot of uh, a lot of processes, and so backtracking and figuring out what we could have done wrong. There we go. So I'm using the, one of the threads I was reading. They were saying uh, this is what is recommended: Java seven and eight. I was using eleven. So what I've done is I've changed that, and then I'm going to run. Marvin, to see if this helps. I hope it does help. Um, in an ideal case, when you followed through the instructions down to the dot, um, you shouldn't really have to go through some of these hurdles that we've had to go through. I don't know, we wasted a few minutes there, but uh, hopefully this should be able to work. So what I did as a fix was I just changed the version of the JDK, the software component. If you remember, I'd mentioned that uh, 
the prerequisite software components that are needed is the JDK, right? Which can be the Open JDK or the Oracle JDK, Marvin, Apache Ant, PostgreSQL, servlet container, and Git. Now, when 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 we we're in three point two, I had mentioned that I already had JDK installed, but I had I had foolishly forgotten that the specific version of JDK that is prescribed version 7 or 8. By default, I had version 11 configured in my, in my case, and I see the problem is still there. I see the version, the thing is still there. I wonder if this means uh, restarting the entire building process from scratch. Uh, in which case, it would take a bit of time, maybe. But uh, let's see what they're saying here. A bit hesitant to restart the whole thing because this is going to instead of updating it. Uh, this is in, uh, Let's try and check here where they're saying there's a resolution. Let's try and see if we can find this. I'm so hoping we could uh, successfully install this. That would be a nice way of wrapping up the day. We've got the time here. But it appears that's not going to be the case today. Sorry, Doc. Hi. Yes. Uh, can this this space be installed using Windows rather than me yes, using the yes. commands? Oh, well, unfortunately, there are certain things that you have no control over. Like some of the things I was doing right now, you would have to still use the command line. When you're actually installing this space, you run these commands. But for the prerequisite software components, if you're on Windows, if you're on Windows, and if you want to install this on Windows, not Linux, you'd, you'd be double-clicking these components. So you double click and then you go next, 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 next. So okay. the answer is partially yes, yes, but not completely. Okay. There is no yeah. difference using the, the command one and the Windows one. Is there any difference? Oh. No, so the difference when, is... Or it can just come out the, the same. The interface. Usually when you're installing this space on a production computer, the interface is the same. Okay. The interface is completely the same, actually. Uh, it is the same. That's a nice question.
trying to see if we can find the problem to this. And uh, the thing that we found the thread is. Uh, Hmm, what do we, if we, I wonder if we can do this. <clears throat> that thing is too pointing to, I think that's a problem here. That thing is too pointing to 18. This is shame, actually. What if we say the... Let me try to do this, one, two. DK8 home. I'm trying to avoid restarting this because uh, so th this idea of uh, Windows, by the way, is. Uh, Again, it, it depends on, because you wouldn't install, you need to install this on a server computer system, right? An application like this, an application that is going to be accessed by a number of people at the same time. And so it wouldn't be a normal Windows 10, it would be like the Windows server operating system. Um, but that being said, if it's on a Windows server operating system, then you, you, you would be installing these these artifacts here, like Apache Maven, like you would Windows, uh, I mean, Microsoft Word, for instance, or Microsoft Office. So it wouldn't, uh, I'm trying to see if this thing is doing anything useful here. It wouldn't be as, oh, it's being skipped again, Christ. Are there any other questions you might have uh, concerns about the installation process? These are good questions about Unix and Windows. Usually your IT department would um, your IT department would decide for you on your behalf if you have an IT department. But if you are doing this as a library, you'd have to make a decision. You know, are you going to install this on a Windows server uh, or a window? You can actually install this on a normal Windows operating system. Or are you going to... Um, or are you, oh, I see some screaming outside, or are you going to install this on a Unix-like operating system, right? Um, uh, so, of course, the decision could be entirely centered around the fact that expertise would be an important uh, aspect to look at. It looks like we are making progress here. Uh, maybe you'd install on Windows because you know that there are people that would be able to help if there's something wrong. By the way, you see this build success? Yay, this is where we think the almighty God, I suppose, I don't know. The Lord, right? Thank you, Lord. Now, um, I don't know if God has anything to do with this, but we must thank the Lord nonetheless, as my mother always says. So we've done, we've built this successfully. I know there's, there's a lot of stuff in between here, but nonetheless, we've done this. So build is successful, right? Once the build is successful, right? Once the build is successful, 
which was somewhere way down here. We're gonna go down to where we were. We were on the installation. So the problem, by the way, was the type of JDK version and I had to change the environment variable. So the build is successful. We executed Marvin, like so. We're not going to waste time to install Mirage 2, which looks more beautiful, by the way, than uh, the current version of XML UI. It's much more visually appealing. It's, it's in that it uses Bootstrap. Then we install this space. So we change directory into this location. You see this? We will come here. We will get into this space, get into this space. Oh no, it's, it's actually this space source right where we were in. Sorry. Oops. We were in the right direction, or uh, right directory, sorry. This space, but we have to go in target. This space source, and then we go into this space, and then target. And then we get into this space installer, right? So we build the application, we get into this space, uh, this space and the hyphen installer, and then we issue and fresh install, and fresh install. Right, so we just issue this command here, and then boom. Ooh, what is wrong now? What have we done wrong? Hmm. More errors. This is a very strange error that uh, it, it fails right on the go. So it was a connection issue. So you run ant uh, so that you now install, right? Uh, we were building the application, we just installed it, boom. Uh, oh, and I hope this will work now. I think we should be able to see, we should be able to create an initial admin account, let's see here. We need to deploy, we need to actually uh, manually install it. So let's see if we can. So you see this, the dispatch code has been installed. I don't know if you can see this. We were here and install blah, 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 blah. I'm trying to get to the part which says uh, it has been installed, right? The dispatch code has been installed, done. Uh, I'm trying to see if it's actually been copied on our behalf. Web applications. Okay, we've installed this. So you notice that the web applications that have been built are in here, right, in this directory. So we'll find them in here. And then they're telling us that uh, you can copy these applications from here to the appropriate web app directory, right? So what we could do is do this. We could say, uh, uh, go to Tomcat, Alina, this is where we need to hope, I think, is it in here? Where is Tomcat? In an ideal case, this would have to be done carefully and meticulously, but we, we're looking at time here. We'll just go to share Tomcat 8. We just want to deploy them directly. Uh, is it in B? No. No. Oh, 
host. Now what I'm, what I'm what I'm looking for now is just a place where I'll be able to find where it is. This is, I think this, this isn't supposed to be that difficult. Could it be in here maybe? Use a Redex. Okay. No? What I'm, what I'm trying to do now is to copy these things that we've built. These, let's just go back here. I'm trying to build, to get these applications here, in the correct directory, because these are, if you remember, when I was showing you the different applications that are built, JSP, OAI, RDF, REST, Solar, this is what collectively makes up this space. So we've built these applications, we've installed them, so now I just want to deploy them. But the way that I want to deploy them is I want to use a very easy to follow method where you just copy them to to the web app directory, but I'm, I'm still a bit, oh, maybe I can check for Catalina Home, right? Let's just say Ubuntu, Ubuntu 18.4 Catalina Home. Tomcat 8, Catalina Home. I'm just looking for, I'm just looking for the location itself. Let's just try and see if maybe this, oops. There we go, this is what I was looking for. And I couldn't find it, right? So if I go in here, this is where I want to dump the things, right? So I'll come here, and then I'll say boom. Or I will cut, yeah, and then I'll copy this, and then I'll say uh, copy, remote this, everything in here to here. Uh, hopefully should be able to finish very, very soon. I should have been synchronizing this. Uh, this I'll just say, I'll sync. Understand that anyway. Um, <clears throat> right, so hopefully this should be able to copy the files. So I'm just copying the the, the files that uh, have been built, these files into the web app directory so that they are saved, right? So that once we run the web application, right? So just wait and see once we finish here. Okay, so done. And then once we copy them across, they're saying we start the server container. So we, and then we should be able to run the initial, uh, we should be able to create. So if you notice the instructions, we, we copy them across and then we start the server container. Um, and then we'll make the initial administrator account. So what we're going to do now is we are going to restart the server container and it's quite easy. Just say restart. Hopefully this will work. Sometimes it doesn't, maybe permission issues. Let's try and see. And usually once you do this, you can go to the logs and then uh, try and see if you can view what's happening to Catalina, right? So you notice once I started, this is what's happening. The It's restarting and all the different applications are going to be deployed. Um, 
And so, uh, then we are saying afterwards, we make the initial administrator account, assuming everything has worked just fine. We create the first E person. So once you, you deploy the application, the very first thing you need to do is you need to create a root account. That account is the one, is it going to be the administrator account which is going to be used to create other accounts, right? And I think these details are outlined somewhere here, I guess, I don't know. And what we did was we deployed everything, but you can selectively choose which applications you want to deploy. Like there's no reason for you to deploy the two interfaces, right? Just one interface is sufficient. So we're going to see if we can create the admin account. There we go. So we'll log in to this, we'll go to this location and then just issue the create administrator account. We'll go here. We'll go in here bin directory, right? Then we'll run this dspace bin directory, and then we'll run this dspace. Dspace account and say run admission. Permission issues, we just need to do that. Right. Okay, so hopefully this works. If it works, then it will bring up a prompt where uh, and it's not working. It's supposed to bring up a prompt where we, uh, oh wow. So I think this would work. Okay, so maybe the application hasn't yet fully started, I guess, according to this at least. We, we wait until this thing is fully started. There's errors there also. But the idea behind what we just did is when we go to localhost and we say XML, I hope this, at least this works, XML UI. Um, this was supposed to bring up, server did not start. This was supposed to bring up, um, okay, this is, In any case, the build, the build has, the, the application has been built. It's just that uh, the deployment seems to be acting up. And I'm wondering, let's see if we can restart this. So when you when you, you install the application, the, the way it works is the servlet container or servlet, yeah, the servlet container has to be up and running before it works, right? Which is what I'm doing, and I'm I'm, I'm cautious here because I want to check the logs as well to make sure that the correct things are actually happening, but it appears not. You know, memory mix. Okay. Sadly, so many errors here that would have to debug. I'm trying to see if I can get to the first part of the error. Wait for it, but in the meantime, we can check. Yes. 
again, at this stage, you'd have, um, you would have already deployed uh, this piece application to be up and running. Uh, Maybe up and running. Let's see if we can find the. Uh, I think this will be here. This is from 10 years ago, but I'm trying to see if this will be useful in the case. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping this could still work even if we have those errors in the logs, which is, it doesn't look like it's going to be the case. Let's try this again. So now, yeah, nothing. GSP UI still fading as well. I wonder if this has anything to do with permission or not quite. Maybe. Uh, let me just try and see if I can. Look like that's the case, but that's nonetheless. The problem that is there is uh, the errors starting up the separate containers. So this so this could be this this could be related to Apache Tomcat. Uh, it's de it's definitely related to Apache Tomcat. But I was I was hoping changing the permissions would probably fix the problem. Let's just wait and see. Uh, if not, then uh, this is twenty zero two. I we'll have to. I think we prayed to God too soon, because uh, clearly, clearly this didn't work first time. And I wonder if I'm talking to myself. Nine people so far, which is good. Um, I haven't seen any errors so far. Let's just uh, see if this will work. No errors so far. Ah, oh, more errors are coming up now. See if we can find what this is all about. Mm. 
This is a lie, we just restarted the save and this error is still there. <coughs> um, Uh, if you can hold on just a little, let's try a little while longer. Let's try and see if we can, uh, ooh, if we can fix this. But I do hope that uh, this gives you an idea of uh, sometimes you might reach out to IT. Why are these people from IT not doing work, right? Um, turns out that sometimes the work can take significantly longer than, than anticipated. Bad things happen. But the good news is that we have definitely managed to install, to build the application successfully. We install it. The only issue now is um, because it turns out, and I think the error is still there, still, because it turns out that uh, building is not sufficient. Once you build, you need to install it. Once you install it, you need to uh, deploy it. Right? And then upon deployment, that's when you start accessing the application, and that error is still there. Uh, Hmm. Oh, maybe. I wonder if this is just specific to XML UI interface. Maybe these other things can be accessed on the, probably not, but I think we did try this. Mm. Ah, maybe 
Wait a minute. Oh, this is the thing here. I don't know if you, I don't know if people are still around, but I think this could be the reason or not. Maybe not. Let me just try and go to root. Them. I, I, I was assuming that maybe, again, it could be a question of um, permissions. So I just gave um, everyone access to that directory, but it could not, maybe it's not. I see there's errors still popping up here. See if we can find the solution to this problem. Yep. If we Yeah, it's error is still there. I think it's still coming up, likely to come another week.
there's likely something we did wrong, something we're not doing right, and I cannot figure out what it is, but at the same time, I'm obsessed to response there. Hmm, this is interesting. I do hope people are still there. We are almost uh, at the end, if not, I don't know, but... Doc, we are still here, for me. Ah, okay, I, I hope it's... Uh, How about that, then? Yeah, it's, it's uh, fine, right? For me, obviously the concern is just how to deal with the number of errors that um, we've come across so far. I'm sure you, well, you are very experienced in this field and we are just learning to install this system. So what is the best way of um, identifying these errors and dealing with them? Because with the installation of such systems, when something, one thing goes wrong, even if it's a full stop, it won't be successfully installed. So if we are given the responsibility or if we take up the responsibility to uh, implement these systems in our organization, how do we go about it without failing? Right, right. Um, well, so, well, we wouldn't say I'm experienced anyway for startups, but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I've been done this in years actually. The thing, right, is uh, when you're, if you notice, we are trying to cut corners in most of, I was quickly walking you through the, processes the, the steps because I knew it would take time. So we likely missed a step. So the first starting point is you make sure you just follow the instructions down to the dot. Okay. When you do that, you shouldn't be able to run into problems. But if you do run into problems, if you notice what I'm doing, I'm just looking up information. Yeah. This happens to be, if you look at, if you remember one of the slides I had, I mentioned that thought they seem to suggest that um, what 40% of repositories out there use this space. The beauty with that is that the problems that you run into um, are problems that other people have already gone through. So you, you are more likely to find a solution online. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but, but also, I mean, usually when you're doing this, I mean, you probably, probably besides the manual and information online, maybe you can easily bounce back ideas, bounce back ideas from other people that might be experienced. It's, it's not, um, we were rushing things. Ideally, this, this has been, I would like to think it's been perfected. We are currently at version six. Uh, this thing has been around for years, right? Mm -hmm. And it undergoes, once a new release has come out, there's extensive testing that takes place. So by the time it's released, a lot of people would have figured out what sort of problems they are. Like 6.3 has been around for probably a little over a year, if not two years now, right? So. Maybe a year, actually, not two years. <clears throat> because a new stable release is released almost every year. Okay. Yeah, so it should be, I think we were rushing things, which is why we ran into that problem. And I think the initial configuration here might have something to do with this. Mm. Any other issues? Nothing for me.
Hello, Doc. Hi. Yeah, on, on the versions, you mentioned that the versions are released maybe twice per year. Uh, once maybe one installed um, the old version, uh, does it automatically upgrade to the latest version? No. One no. Has to... no. Unfortunately, it's not like uh, it's not like Windows where you. Uh, <laughs> It's not like Windows where you um, you just say install automatic updates. You have to you typically undergo the same process actually, which is why, by the way, if you look at uh, instances like uh, this, uh, this is this space. Uh, this is CBU. If you go to CBU, for instance, and you notice that they're using an older version, right? This, this is an and there's no way of checking the vision, but you can see that this this copyright thing was from ten years ago. You'd have to explicitly upgrade this, but but the thing is the upgrade process is almost the same also. So you you shouldn't really have to shouldn't really have to worry so much about it. You, you, the upgrading, upgrading is the same process that I've, I've, I've been going through right now. So, yeah, so it's, it's not that hard. Uh, or maybe it is. So it's just important, I think, just to maintain the same one <laughs> instead <laughs> of uh, doing upgrades each and every time. Oh, the new the devices. No, the beauty with the upgrade, right, is that. Um, Sometimes there are new features, enhancements that are introduced, right? Like, uh, so older versions could not easily be integrated with, uh, oh, wow. with, uh, they couldn't easily be integrated with uh, DOIs, right? Uh, in fact, newer versions, I think, have um, have incorporated ORCID. I don't know if people have heard of ORCID, right? Previously, you couldn't. So this. Oh, is it open research and contributor IDs, right? So, so the, the other versions of this space, it's hard to, to link publications to ORCID IDs, but newer versions do. So, so it's, it's important that you upgrade. Sometimes, uh, Security enhancements, right? So I, I I don't know where that is coming from. Maybe it's because uh, the process seems like it's very painful or something. Yeah, I think or it's too is, involving. I don't know. Especially to us. <laughs> yeah. So the, the reason it appears like uh, oh, there's too memory leaks here. The reason it appears like it's too involving is because I think we've missed some certain steps here, which is why this is happening. But in an ideal case, if um, this, this guy is still there, in an ideal case, if we had done, the, if we, we had followed through the instructions down to the dot, we would not have experienced this problem. And you shouldn't, ha and you wouldn't actually experience these problems yourself. So it's um, it's not that uh, hard actually. It's just a, you find it. Yeah, it's coming from here. You do it uh, a couple of times, and you should be fine. And, and the beauty with this is maybe you do it once a year, 
uh, or maybe once maybe after two years, right? Maybe you actually even do it once if you, are, you want to be like CBOA, just install it once and don't up upgrade it, right? <laughs> um, it still works, but the other enhancements, um, you wouldn't actually have access to some of the nice features. Sure, I'm sure there's a uh, there's something we are not doing right here. I'm trying to figure out if figure out what I've done wrong. And then we can say the fake Tomcat A. Yeah, we've done we've done a number of uh, things here and retracing. Now, in certain instances, what I would have normally done my, myself is, if I'm going around in circles like we are right now, is restart the installation from scratch. Uh, because sometimes trying to fix a problem, trying to identify where the problem might have occurred, especially if there are numerous steps involved would take significantly longer than just restarting the whole thing from scratch. Right? So you restart it from scratch and then hope that um, hope that you'll be able to fix the problem. Now the, the unfortunate part about restarting from scratch is you'd never <laughs> you'd never know what what you did wrong. Um, but I don't know. Doc, I think I, I agree with you. Maybe if we can start from scratch, maybe when we have time, sometime. Oh, oh, you want to leave? I'm, I'm wondering how many people are there. So we're thinking they we're almost there. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I, I'm sure we should be able to fix this problem. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong things altogether. The error. Let's give it just five more minutes, and then if it still fails, then we can call it a day uh, or a night, I suppose. Okay, doc. Good evening, Doc. Hi. Hey, Doc, some of us are lost now. Oh, okay. If you're lost, uh, here's the thing. I'm going to stick around until I think I uh, think it's a character flaw. I'll stick around until I try and find the solution. It will be recorded. Um, I always, what I do is if, if there are long, um, what do you call this? If there are long videos, when I have time, I, I truncate them somehow, but I haven't had time to do this. Yeah, we can call it a night, but I'll stick around because I want to see if I can fix this problem. If I don't fix it now, I'll probably never fix it. I have to fix this. 
Uh, so I guess I'll see you. I'll see you on Wednesday. It's been fun. Uh, uh, Wednesday interaction starts at 17. There's a talk by Zachary Zul from uh, the University of Zambia Library. So please join us. Okay. Is it? Right. Are we going to have another class for this installation? Or would have to watch the recorded. Well, it would have to be the, the recording, unfortunately. Uh, we due to time. So the next inter, the next class we have is probably after Abel's talk or yeah. So it's Friday something. Maybe it's Thursday, in which case we transition to module number seven. Okay. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll attempt to see if I can finalize the installation and then you, you can obviously play it back or something. Uh, if I don't manage to finish, I'll start from scratch and then I'll just record a separate screencast, which I think would be the most, um, I, I think the wise thing to do, seeing as, um, I think that would be easier to follow through. Mm, yeah. So I'll see you on Wednesday then. Thanks a lot. Uh, All right. We're, we're parting on, on, on an unfortunate, yeah, yes, on unfortunate terms. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.